This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, members, you're all welcome to the meeting of the uh, Justice Committee. If you can do the needful with any electronic devices, that would be appreciated. Any declarations of financial or relevant interests related to the business today, um, now is the time to declare it. If not, uh, there are no apologies. We have. Right, Chair, can I declare Sorry, um, Rachel. an interest in correspondence item number 7.3? Okay, I'll take note of that one. Um, with no apologies, we're joined by committee members, um, I believe Gemma uh, Dolan and Sinead Bradley via the Starleaf facility, and you're, you're both welcome to the meeting. And I'll ask the clerk now if any members have delegated their vote under the appropriate standing order. Um, in accordance with standing order 1156, Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon, in the event that the Starleaf connection is lost. Okay, thank you. So item two on the agenda is the draft minutes of the meetings that were held on the 3rd of November and the 5th of November. They're in pages five and six of your uh, meeting pack and uh, draft minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of November are pages seven to 12 um, in terms of the draft minutes for the meeting held on the 5th of November. So if members are content that those minutes are a true reflection of proceedings of the meetings, then I will sign them accordingly. Agreed. Members content. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no matters arising from those uh, minutes, unless any member have any issues they wish to raise in respect of those minutes. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda. <coughs> item four of the agenda relates to the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Um, given consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill was postponed on, from Tuesday and will now take place on the 17th of, no of November. As requested in her letter dated the 9th of November, uh, arrangements have been made for the Minister uh, of Justice to attend the meeting through the Starleaf facility uh, to discuss her amendments to clauses 9, 11 and 17 of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill and also her position in respect of the Committee's six amendments. So, members, there's, the relevant correspondence related to this item is on pages 15 through to 39 of the meeting pack. That includes a letter from the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People in respect of Clause 9. Uh, that has been brought forward by uh, the Minister and also it refers to uh, amendments brought forward by Ms Rachel Woods and uh, referring then to the position uh, in relation to Clauses 11 and 17. So, for ease of reference, the wording of the committee amendments and the text of the minister's alternative training amendment they can be found on pages three to six of the tabled pack, uh, which hopefully members have. So, at this stage, I'm going to welcome the minister Naomi Long and uh, Dr. Veronica Holland, who is head of violence against the persons branch from the Department of Justice, to the meeting. Um, the meeting. It will be recorded by Hansard, and then a transcript of that will be published in due course. So, in the first instance, um, we're going to ask the minister to deal with her amendments, which relate to clauses 9, 11, and 17 of the bill. So, Minister Long, you're very welcome to the meeting. I trust you're making a speedy recovery. Uh, of course, the committee wishes you well in that respect. But at this stage, I'll hand over to yourself. Um, thank you, um, Chair, and I hope that um, you're able to hear me. This is my first experience um, of Starleaf. I've used pretty much every other online platform, but this is new to me, so I'm hoping that it's working and that I'm able to be heard um, adequately. Um, first of all, thank you um, to the committee um, ahead of uh, the consideration stage um, of obviously um, being willing to listen um, to the uh, to the presentation um, on these issues. I'm also accompanied, as you say, by Veronica um, today, who is Head of Violence Against the Person Branch. Um, I realised that we met um, two weeks ago. It seems that committee meetings um, with the Minister are a bit like buses. They're none for six months and then two come along at once. So apologies for, for that. Um, as you're aware, due to having to self-isolate um, ahead of a negative COVID test result, um, the date for the consideration stage, unfortunately, had to be postponed for a short time, and we're due now to meet on Tuesday. Um, it will not impact on the ability to complete the legislative process by Christmas recess. 
um, as further consideration and final consideration stage can hopefully happen on Monday the 7th and Tuesday the 15th of December. Can I also um, take the opportunity before I begin to make two apologies to the committee? The first is that I tweeted about my disappointment on consideration stage of the bill being delayed before my letter had actually issued um, to the department formally. It was my understanding the letter had been sent when I sent my tweet, um, and so I apologise. There was no disrespect intended to the committee, um, but it was my error, and I apologise for that. It should not be the case that the committee find out about serious and um, substantive business via Twitter, and I can only apologise for that. I also want to apologise <laughs> um, to Rachel Woods. Um, I have issued correspondence to her um, in the last hour, um, in relation to a letter which she had written to me in respect of um, some of the amendments that we're going to discuss this afternoon. Um, as you may appreciate, it has been um, a busy week. And uh, I only managed to clear that paper um, in the last hour or so. Um, again, I don't know if Rachel will have it an opportunity, therefore, to consider the contents of it, but I'm happy um, to try to accommodate a further discussion with her um, subsequent to her having the opportunity to do so. Um, just before I turn to the detail um, of the um, committee amendments, as the Chair has suggested, um, we should probably start um, with the key issues. Um, around um, Amendments 9, 11 and 17. So, with respect, I'll start with Cause 9. I understand there have been extensive discussions on this to date and I also note members' concerns about the stage at which these amendments have been brought forward. My officials could have agreed to this at an earlier point. Um, however, I hope that you will appreciate the quantum of engagement on a detailed bill which has taken place. And again, the delay was not in any way intended to frustrate the committee in doing its business. What is important, however, is that the changes are being made to take account of the fact that some members remain concerned um, about these issues and felt that the reassurances that we had provided from the department weren't adequate. Three changes are proposed in Clause 9. The first is to make it explicit that any or all of the three elements of the child aggravator could apply. That is where behaviour is directed at the child or use is made of them to direct behaviour at the victim. Saw, heard or was present for the abusive behaviour or a reasonable person would consider the behaviour to have an adverse impact and the child usually resides with the victim or offender or both. While it's considered that any or all of the aggravators could apply in the current draft, my intention is to make explicitly clear this is the case and that a number of the aggravating aspects may apply at one time. A further amendment to Clause 9 provides that a child does not have to be aware of the abusive behaviour uh, for there to be an adverse impact or for the aggravator to apply. Given that the first two aspects of the child aggravator turn on the facts, there is abusive behaviour um, directed at a child or the child is used to direct at another or the child saw or was present, it could be argued that this is again not needed. However, to take a committee's concerns, we agreed that the explanatory and financial memorandum would make clear that the involvement of the child could be unwittingly or unwillingly. However, on considering this matter further, um, I feel that this may not provide, in fact, the necessary robust assurance to the committee um, that you saw because the explanatory and financial memorandum, whilst it sets out the thinking of the department um, and of the behind the bill, it does not form part of the bill. And therefore, the, in the intention of that amendment is to provide the necessary reassurance to the committee um, that the provision is as robust as possible. Finally, having further taken account of the concerns raised um, by a number of members during earlier sessions, particularly at Paul and Rachel, provision is made for aggravation where a reasonable person would consider that abusive behaviour would adversely impact on a child. This provides that there does not need to be evidence that the child ever had any awareness of the accused behaviour and any understand the nature of the accused behaviour or to have actually been adversely affected by the accused's behaviour. 
again, while this could, and I concede, have been made at an earlier stage, it is intended in the spirit of addressing committee concerns before this legislation passes in order that the provisions are as robust as possible and that we maximise consensus. It remains the position that the child aggravator can apply simply by virtue of the fact that the child saw, heard or was present for the abuse, or indeed that behaviour was directed at them, or use made them to direct abusive behaviour at another person. These turn on the facts with no conditions attached to this, no evidence of impact being needed, and that the amendment in no way detracts from this. On the reasonable person provision, I note the amendment put forward by Rachel Woods and the concern in her recent correspondence that my amendment is limited to where the child lives with either or both parents. In that regard, and I realise Rachel will not have had sight of my letter um, in all likelihood or only receiving it um, as we speak, it is important to remember that the first two of the three child aggravators turn on the facts and direct behaviour. In these cases, it is appropriate that there can be aggravation where any child is involved. The third, that of the reasonable person, considering that it would have an adverse impact, would cover more indirect behaviour, less overt behaviour, where this is in the context of the wider familial home environment. This would deal with incidents where a child is in an abusive environment but is not directly involved as such. For example, where a person is prevented from leaving the home and taking a child to school or a medical appointment, where the abusive behaviour impacts on the child's well-being and development but does not necessarily directly involve them. Rachel's amendment mirrors my second and third amendment to Clause 9. Broadly speaking, they have the same intent, albeit with a slightly different drafting approach. The key difference, however, relates to the fact that my amendment in relation to the reasonable person is subject to the child having to live with either the offender or victim or both. This is intended to deal with incidents where a child is in an abusive environment but is not directly involved as such. It also reflects the fact that living in an environment in which domestic abuse is carried out is what can most adversely affect a child. The very broad approach which is proposed in Rachel's amendment would capture indirect behaviour regardless of connection between individuals. Given that the reasonable person provision will potentially address the outworking of abusive behaviour that is indirect as opposed to direct behaviour, I believe Rachel's amendment would pose a risk of capturing incidents and giving rise to increased sentencing where it is not appropriate. My approach that I have adopted and the department has adopted also reflects that which has been adopted in Scotland, and so I don't support Rachel's amendment. Finally, Rachel had also tabled an amendment to Clause 9 to provide child's aggravator would also apply if at any time in the commission of the offence the accused threatened to direct behaviour at a child. While I consider that the threatening behaviour aspect would be captured by the offence with the child aggravator and um, then applying to it, this provision would make that aspect explicit and I am therefore content to support that amendment. So I think Chair, I don't know if you wish to then move on to 11 and 17 or whether you to look at clause nine um, and then move on to 11 and 17 afterwards. Yeah, well, we'll maybe pick up on clause nine um, and bring in some of the members that want to raise questions on that. So I know Rachel and Paul Frew have laboured these areas in previous months, so I'm going to offer either of them to go first. By all means, Rachel, tear on. Okay. Um, Thank you, Minister, for that. Um, I appreciate. I got your email at uh, five minutes ago, so it's just um, sent to my account. So I haven't, I haven't read it, obviously. Um, so I will do so after after the committee. Um, but I am slightly baffled by the approach taken with regard to clause nine, and you'll appreciate as we have been labouring this for a number of months, much to, I'm sure, at the annoyance of other members, but it was very, very important to get this right. And for the example that we're sitting here today, now debating two sets of amendments where we were told none were needed. So and, and at the outset, I suppose, you know, a number of organisations, Women's Aid, Action for Children, Bernardo's, NSPCC, NICI, Human, um, Human Rights Commission, all, and, and the bar, um, specifically the bar, all raised legitimate concerns over Clause 9 in evidence to this committee. 
So I'm wondering just from the outset, when did you become aware of the concerns raised by these organisations? And did you have any discussions with officials at that point to address the issues raised? Yeah, I mean, Rachel, we have been having these discussions. And I mean, first of all, as I say, I apologise for the letter. This week has been um, test. So um, it has been difficult, I have to say, um, to to turn things around in the speed which, which I normally offer. Um, with respect to Clause 9, yes, we had this discussion. The, the issue here is not about whether I feel that these were needed, because my position means, as does the department's position, that they are not necessary in terms of the outworking of plans. However, we do recognise that there are genuine concerns being expressed by the committee and in the spirit of trying to reach consensus, we brought forward Clause 9 as a way to make explicit things which we believe are implicit, but we had not convinced the committee and, as you said, we had not convinced others. Um, that that was sufficiently clear. So we felt it was important um, in order that everyone had confidence in this bill because the purpose of this is not um, to set up a disagreement between the committee and the department or the department and the sector. It is to get as much consensus as possible and the best possible outcome. And if by making these issues explicit rather than implicit, we can reassure people um, that it is more robust, then whether, frankly, I believe it necessary or not, um, I am willing to make the amendments. So that's the position that I have come to, um, having heard all of the information in the round, and also the fact that a number of members, yourself and Paul included, uh, have been particularly concerned about this. And you know, the, the process of drafting and the process of taking this bill through um, you know, is one that, from my point of view, um, I have been listening, I have been responding, um, but I also, at this stage, at consideration stage, have the opportunity um, to make decisions um, in terms of how we want to proceed. And I decided that, on balance, it was better at this stage to make those things explicit rather than to, make, to leave them implicit um, in the legislation. Um, I also, when it came to the discussions around this in the explanatory and financial memorandum, um, and the committee at that stage um, had some um, degree of, um, I suppose, certainty around that. When I looked at that in more detail with my officials, I felt that that was not the way to proceed. I recognised as the explanatory and financial memorandum sets out the context in which the department is framing and therefore it may be a material consideration if, uh, if an offence is if the nature of an offence is debated it is not part of the law it does not stand part of the bill and therefore i feel that on reflection it was the right thing to do and um, to put this on the face of the bill rather than to put it in that um, explanatory and financial memorandum so i mean it is the, it's the basis of reflecting on the case report um, and reflecting on the discussions that we had had to date that have led me to move clause nine. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose I'm just trying to figure out kind of a timeline of this. Um, so it was after the committee's report was published because I'm aware that at, the, at that time the only person to to vote against. Clause 9, as it stands, was myself, um, so it, it, I appreciate that I am taking up a significant time here of the committee's time um, on amendments that I, as an individual MLA, and I believe to be published, um, a, another committee member has added their name to it. Um, so I apologise to the committee that this is taken up as an individual MLA, um, but it, it was not the committee's position at the time. With the issues with Clause 9, it was my issues with Clause 9, um, and, yeah. and to, put to Mr. Frew then as well. So I'm try trying to just trying to piece together when the decision was made. Was it on reflection of the the, the chat that we had in committee on putting details into the explanatory no memorandum rather than my amendments that were tabled? Um, when, when that decision was made for the, 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 your, the set of, of amendments on Clause 9, there, it was tabled by yourselves? Well, there, are a, there are a number. I mean, first of all, um, 
the timeline was fascinating. It won't make any difference, frankly, to the people um, who will be affected by the legislation. So it is more that we get this right than the point at which decisions were taken. There were a number of discussions at committee around Clause 9 that took place over quite a protracted period of time, and including with yourself. Uh, we, at different stages, have very resolutions to this, which we were then proceeding with. So, for example, in the case of the explanatory and financial memorandum um, offer that we had made, when she came to the point where we were in the process of bringing that forward, um, I then considered that in the round, having also listened to the rest of the discussion on this, and felt that we could go further than that and put it in the bill, in the legislation, and that, that would give the committee the more, if you like, robust um, reassurance that was required. I'm not sure if the point that you're trying to make is, am I simply responding to your amendments with alternative amendments? I mean, I would simply say this. It's not unusual um, for an MLA or an MP, for that matter, to bring amendments to government legislation in order to pro issue or to try to um, push an issue back onto the agenda. That is, that is part of the process. It is unusual for amendment from which um, MLA or MP to end up on the face of legislation simply because the drafting capacity of the department um, is greater and therefore it is usual where a minister feels that a member has raised a valid point, whether in the discussions or at amendment stage um, that needs to be addressed, that they can then capture those issues in a departmental amendment and have the benefit of the Office of Legislative Council drafting to ensure that it is as watertight as possible. So in proposing changes and amendments to these issues, it is not to disparage the work that has been done by the committee or to undermine the process. It is simply recognition that the drafting capacity of the department means that better legislation can be produced as a result. And it is a reflection of a willingness on my part to try to accommodate in as far as I can without undermining the principles of the bill and the intent of the bill, the wishes of the committee. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, and during our committee deliberations, um, the departmental officials have apologised for an error um, in terms of incorrect advice that was provided to the committee and the misinterpreting of the Scottish law, which maybe meant that they didn't understand what some of us were trying to do in terms of strengthening the clause at an earlier stage. But after this was acknowledged, the officials made it clear that they still didn't need to see changes in the, in the bill, and I appreciate your position is that you still remain that it isn't necessary. But when did you become aware that the officials rejected suggestions made by some committee members was based on the fact that they didn't understand the provisions in the Scottish legislation? And did you see at that point any need to strengthen Clause 9? Well, I mean, this is an ongoing conversation. I mean, to be clear, when my officials come to the committee, they are briefing the committee on my behalf. Um, they're not on a solo run making decisions on their own. So we are having these conversations on an ongoing basis. So there is no point at which, um, if you like, I become aware of what of what my officials are saying. I get a, a, a weekly readout of the committee. I'm aware, if not instantaneously, certainly fairly closely afterwards, what I've been saying um, and what they're doing. But I'm also aware and brief before they come to committee um, about what they're trying to do. So there's no issue of me not being aware of what was discussed. The issue here um, is, is simply that we felt that there were, it was already implicit in the legislation um, and that it was sufficiently robust and that we have reflected now on the basis of the strength of feeling of members of the committee, if not the whole committee, um, on these issues and have decided that in order to accommodate the strength of feeling and acknowledge that, um, that we're willing to make these changes. I, I, I think that that is the way we ought to do business. I would hope um, having spent most of my time in the Assembly as a backbench member um, of the Assembly. I hope that Ministers would respond when I table amendments, be they probing amendments or be they things that I would hope to actually see on the face of the Bill. 
that they would respond and try to incorporate those issues because I believe that that is the best chance of us getting good legislation produced which everyone has a stake in and which all of us um, want to see delivered. So it's my officials are not acting out with the discussions they've had with me, nor are they um, keeping me in the dark um, about what's being said in committee. I'm across that. Um, but what I'm saying is that on reflection, um, at this stage of the bill, and every stage of the bill is a point of reflection, um, I decided that we should proceed to put this and make it explicit. Okay, um, thank you, Minister, and I appreciate your answers so far. Um, one other point, I suppose, and I will let other members in, is, is what, could you, if you could outline the conversations that have been had with Scotland with regard to Clause 9. I personally have not engaged in a conversation, um, so I will pass um, to Veronica um, to answer specifically the advice that officials have taken um, and the discussions that they've had with, the, um, with Scotland in respect of Clause 9. Um, so I'm happy for Veronica to answer um, on that point. Thank you, Minister. Um, discussions, I suppose, in this policy area more generally, not only in relation to the bill, but also other matters. You know, we have ongoing discussions with colleagues in both Scotland and also um, our counterparts in, in Home Office. So there are a, a range of discussions that take part with them or it would take place with them from time to time in, in terms of a, a wide range of policy matters we would have engaged, you know, we have engaged with Scottish officials um, both when their legislation was going through and also in, in terms of the, the provisions that we have been taking forward more generally in, in terms of what their experience has been in relation to their offence, how it's been operating in practice, um, you know, and, and to try and get a sense of some of the issues that we need to take account of. Okay, so I, I, I was try, what I was trying to get at is um, basically how, how many conversations have been had with Scotland, who have they been had with, and anything recently based on the amendments and the understanding of the bill at the moment. What my, my basic point, and I will reiterate this on Tuesday, Scottish legislation is fundamentally different to ours. The meaning of a connected person is fundamentally different than ours. Um, a and B can only be partners and ex-partners. Therefore, I do not see any need for the residency bar that has been put in. And I wonder what, if any, conversations have been had with the Scottish Government or indeed the Chief Prosecutors or a range of prosecutors on the implementation of Clause 9 in Scotland and its effectiveness. We've had discussions with officials both in the Scottish Government as part of this process. We've also had discussions with um, the prosecutorial uh, colleagues as well in relation to this. We haven't had any discussion in terms of kind of that underpinning um, sense in relation to the, the differential in, in terms of the scope of the two offences. I suppose in, in terms of the, the position that's being adopted and, and why we consider there isn't a need for um, anything different in relation to that simply by virtue of the fact that our offence covers familial as, as well as um, intimate partner relationships is due to kind of that breakdown in the aspects between um, the limbs of the aggravator. So as the Minister has noted, the first two relate to direct um, behaviour against a child or involving a child, the third reasonable person aspect is considered to be uh, more in relation to indirect or, or less overt, overt behaviours um, and, and largely focusing in on um, the, and, and certainly this is something that was covered in the, um, the Scottish evidence during their bill going through, it's, it's intended to cover kind of the, um, the, the home environment that an individual child may be living and um, for for others where the child is a, a victim of the offence or a, a victim in, in relation to the domestic abuse more generally and they are captured by the domestic abuse offence, that direct behaviour would be um, picked up through that. So it's really that distinction, I suppose, between direct and indirect um, abusive behaviour that, that is being captured by these elements and, and therefore the distinction between um, the first two applying to any child, because again, it's, it's that direct experience where the, the child is is present or behaviour has been directed at them or use is being made of them to direct that behaviour. The reasonable person aspect is very much about kind of that less, you know, the, the indirect behaviour um, and, and the wider environment that uh, the child may be experiencing. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there because I, I don't I, I don't agree. Um, and that's my interpretation, and that's why the amendments have been tabled in the way that they are. Um, and I will make my case again well, on Tuesday. Can, well, can I can I suggest, um, given that both, I mean, I'm conscious of two things. First of all, that we're now halfway through the hour that I have um, before executive um, reconvene 
this afternoon and also um, the fact that we have the other clauses. Could I suggest um, if it would be helpful um, that I am happy to meet um, with yourself because uh, you obviously haven't had the benefit of being able to go through my letter in detail um, and that we that I would offer that yourself and if there are any other committee members who are interested in this particular issue because I know that Paul Frew um, has also been interested in particularly around clubs nine that I'm happy to meet with you um, at some point tomorrow um, just to have a, a fuller discussion um, because as things stand at the moment I'm conscious that we do have the rest of these to go through um, and I would be keen as far as is possible, as I say, to reach consensus on this um, rather than, than not. And I think that would be helpful for the committee, for, for the department and for the sector. Um, and ultimately, I think it would be better for the bill. So look, if, if you're open to that, I'm happy to make that offer, um, Mr Chairman, if that helps us move on to the next um, the next clauses. No, Minister, it doesn't actually help. Um, you know, I appreciate executive business, but... We've cleared our agenda. We've taken business off the agenda today to facilitate this. You have been very persistent in asking for a committee meeting. That has been facilitated. Um, I have Paul through Linda Dillon, Sinead Bradley, that all want to ask questions around Clause 9. I've deliberately not engaged on it to allow members to do that. We still haven't got to the other two clauses and then your position on the committee uh, amendments. So I appreciate uh, the pressures that you are under, but this committee has went out of its way to facilitate your persistent requests. Now, if you are not going to be able to accommodate that, then that is obviously a decision for you to take, but I, I want to make sure members get their opportunity um, to deal with okay. their concerns around Clause 9. And so, Paul well, Frey, Chairman, I am in your hands um, in terms of, the, of um, how the meeting goes forward, um, and I am happy to accommodate on Point where executive reconvenes, but as you know, the protocol is that executive business has to take priority um, over um, business of committees, and that is simply the rule. Well, that's that's a decision for you to take. Um, but in terms of the committee, uh, no, that's the protocol. It, it may well be the protocol, but you know the committee has its protocols. The committee's been in your diary now for days. Um, I know the executive has been meeting now consistently for the last three and a half days, um, but this committee cleared its agenda to facilitate your requests to come before it. If you're going to pull out of it, that'll be for you to, to decide if you're going to do that or whether or not uh, other arrangements can be made for you at the executive. But um, Paul Frey has indicated he wanted to speak, and I'll bring him in now. Yeah, yeah and Minister, I'll be as concise as I can. And, and to try and get as many members in at all, because this is important. This Clause 9 is important. And before I reverse you through your Clause 9, let me hit on the point that Rachel last touched on. Uh, 9.2a1 and, and 2 are not directed behaviour. They are not directed behaviour. Read your own memorandum for Section 2a1. Provides that the aggravation applies where it is shown that at any time in commissioning the offence the accused directed behaviour at a child. This could include the accused threatening violence towards a child, to control or frighten the partner or connected person, or be an abusive towards the child. That is not directed behaviour, that's indirected behaviour. So whilst I, I, I get the reason why, and, and you have every right, Minister. Well, sorry, I'll end it there and, and ask you to address that point, because the directed behaviour at the child is not directed behaviour as written in your memorandum. I'm, I'm not following the point that you're making, Paul. I apologise. I'm reading, I'm reading your memorandum when it says yes, that... I, I realise that. that, that the, memorandum, the, the, yeah, the memorandum states that this could include the accused threatening violence towards a child to control or frighten the partner or connected person. That's not a directed behaviour. That's not, as you have described, these two points being, these two limbs being directed behaviour, and then you've needed this new amendment to create the new, new offence, which, quite frankly, does damage to your clause nine. It does damage to your clause nine. So, so, I, I, so I hope I'm coming across right there, and I'm, I've expressed myself correctly. But if you can threaten violence towards a child to control or frighten the person, the connected person or partner, you're not directing that violence at the child. 
So that's not the direct. German, that's to, not to direct clarify, behavior. I have said that with respect to the amendment to clause nine to provide that the child aggravator would apply if at any time in the commission of the offence the accused threatened to direct behaviour at a child. Um, I said what threatened behaviour aspect would be captured by the offence. The child aggravator then applying to this. The provision that uh, that is suggested in Rachel's amendment would make that explicit, and I'm content to support it. No, but you, so so you miss you, you you missed my point with regards to the the two limbs being directed behaviour, and then the, the the need then for the the strengthening of it. But I, I'll move on, Minister. You, you talk about, and you have every right to to make amendments. Every right, as every member is, to make amendments any time to your bill. But if you have done so in the knowledge that it's not necessary, and it's only to provide consensus. Why then would you damage your clause when you know that would have the reverse effect in this committee and, in pro and most probably, the floor of the Assembly? And I'll tell you what I mean by that. You've copied and pasted the residency order from Scotland. It's two totally different bills. Your own officials have told us it's two completely different bills, and they're two different styles of bill. And because of that different style, You've also added descriptors. You've been explicit. When all along you've told us the secret of this bill was not to be explicit. And in your Amendment 5, you talk about a child, like, including uh, an adverse effect on the child, including likely to cause the child to suffer fear, alarm or distress. Why is that there, Minister? Paul, in relation to that bit about the fear, alarm, or distress, you know that is to to try and make clear that that can be encapsulated within that. In, in terms of the um, the nine two provision, um, as you say, it's about directing behaviour at the child, making use of the child, um, or the child see, hearing, or being present. You, we would we would view those very much as direct behaviour in, in relation to the child. But in terms of that bit. Um, about adversely affecting the child, that reference to fear, alarm or distress is just to make clear that that could be captured within harm against that individual child, is, is to try and provide clarity in relation to what that could encapsulate. But for so long, Veronica, you have been telling us it isn't needed, required. And now if the Minister is saying that she doesn't even deem these amendments to be necessary, and I can tell you, and so can Rachel, and I suspect so can the members of this committee now, given that we only caveated this support for Clause 9 on the changes to the memorandum, is that this actually doesn't create a consensus. It has the opposite effect, and you're actually doing damage to your own bill. And it's the committee that's telling you this. You're doing damage to your own bill. And the fact that you need it two goes at this. The fact that you needed Amendment 5 and Amendment 6 tells me everything I need to know, because Rachel Woods gets it, and that's why she can do it in one amendment. In one amendment. Why, 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 are you, why, why do you need to do this if you don't deem it necessary? It just puzzles me. The, the point that I'm making is that we are making explicit what we believed to be implicit. So that's the point that I'm making. And it was an, it was an endeavour on our part to capture the concerns that had been raised about the lack of explicitness in this. So that's, that's the purpose of what we have tried to do. Um, and that was the intention of what we have tried to do. There, in terms of the, the Second Amendment, I've said that I am content with that. Um, but the wider issue in terms of what offences that we capture, and I mean, you make the point, Paul, um, that we're, it's a very different offence to the Scottish offence. In fairness, it is a different offence, but not a different structure of offence to the Scottish offence. Ours is different in that it is wider than the Scottish offence, so that it captures other familial relationships. But it is based around the same broad structures yep. as the Scottish uh, as the Scottish. Structures. So, so Whereas, Minister, for example, so, in England, yeah. so, in England, the structure um, of the offence is entirely different, so, and therefore the comparison between the two would be entirely specious. So, so that's so, I, 
So you make you make my point. You make my point. Not the same offence. You make my point for me, Minister, because but with you adding the residency, you rule out, you rule out the niece, the nephew, you rule out the best friend's daughter, you rule out the next door neighbour's son or daughter. Paul, those will would be captured by the other limbs of, and I, and I suppose that's where we're trying to make that distinction. Those would be captured by the other limbs of um, the offence in terms of where that individual child is present, where they're used to direct behaviour, where behaviour um, is, is towards them. This additional part is really to try and encapsulate that less obvious, less overt behaviour that happens, you know, the impact of living in an environment um, where domestic abuse is being carried out. You know, we would be of the view that in relation to the niece nephew scenario, um, those will be captured by the other aspects of the uh, the provisions within the bill. And, and that's why you include the reasonable person test, and that's fine. But there is absolutely no need for you to add residency in this limb of clause nine when you haven't been consistent throughout clause nine or even the bill around this aspect, and you're you're being explicit in this part of the bill when you haven't been explicit in any other parts of the bill and that does damage to the style and contents of the bill as I've tried to demonstrate to you Veronica and the Minister. This damages your bill, this destroys consensus in this, uh, in this place and I just don't see for the life of me why this cannot, these two clauses cannot be removed and if, if the Minister still feels strongly enough then they can be uh, put back in again at further consideration stage, which is her right. Okay, thank you, Paul. I'm going to bring in Linda Dillon at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to establish a wee bit more about the actual clause itself, rather than well, the first point I want to make, and I understand what the minister is saying around acknowledging and trying to address the concerns of the committee. But to be fair, there actually was consensus of the committee. I know Rachel obviously did put in an amendment, but it wasn't a committee amendment, it was Rachel's amendment. The, the, the committee had actually reached a consensus that the AFM would address it. Now, except that there is now an acknowledgement that perhaps it doesn't. I've spoken to the organisations that raised these concerns, and um, they've highlighted that actually, I mean, every member will be aware of this, and there's, there's a letter in the committee, that they support both the Minister and Rachel's amendment. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about both amendments for different aspects, but I'll get an opportunity to, to question Rachel um, in the committee here. I understand the Chair is going to give us some time to do that, and, and, I, and I appreciate that because I have some questions about Rachel's amendment, and that's not to say that I don't support it. I just have questions that I want to ask, the same as I want to ask about this one. I have the same concerns about the residency one. Now, you've answered some of it, to be fair, Veronica, but my concern is actually because I accept that the adverse impact is not going to be the same on a child who's in visiting, who lives up the road, who happens to be there when something happens, and they run home and say, you know, I don't know what's going on up in that house, but it's nothing to do with me, as would be, as would be experienced by the child who lives in that house and experience it day and daily. Where I'm concerned with the residency is where a child potentially is resident with, for example, grandparents because of what's going on in the home, but there is contact and that the child spends overnight, maybe two or three nights a week within that home, or where the couple are separated and the child is living with some other member of the family and the, part, the abusive partner has a new partner and when the child is staying with them, they're abusive to that other partner because I still think it would have the same impact. You know, that's still your mummy or your daddy, regardless if the other person isn't connected to you. So probably for that reason I'm concerned around the residency and for that reason I probably, to be honest, would struggle and, and I'm at this stage would be saying that I can't support the amendment because I am so concerned about that issue and you know, accept everything that, that Rachel and Paul have said around it, but my concerns go actually even a wee bit further than that again because I accept you can't capture everybody in, in, in every part of this bill and there is parts of it that are, that are very specific to those children that are going to be worst impacted and I think that's a fair approach to take but the residency for me that, that, that stipulation around residing creates a real issue for me um, and as I say I will, I'll, I'll, I'll obviously query the issue in relation to Rachel's, but if I was at this point in time picking 
between the two amendments it, it is going to be to support Rachel's and obviously I, we're not going to take a position as a committee in relation to this we're, okay. we're going to go as our own parties um, and our own MLA, individual MLA's approach and I think that that's so I, I'm just telling the department where I would be sitting at this stage and I, I'll know better obviously after I have the conversation with with Rachel where I sit in relation to, to hers but at this moment in time that need to reside just goes too far for me some of the other issues that Paul has already raised are concerns for me too. There's no, no, no value in me going over them and particularly taking up other people's time. I know she needs one then. So, thank you. It just on that point, on yeah. that point, Linda, and I appreciate the point that you're making. Um, and obviously, it's helpful. Um, you know, I mean, it's helpful in the way that you've put it. I think there is a, there is a context here, and that we are dealing with domestic abuse, and the the, defa the definition around domestic abuse is based around residency so that is you know we haven't added in um familial connections and so on it, it, where there isn't uh if you like a, an element of residency to this so there is something here about um having these relationships in a domestic home environment so that's that's first thing i take your point about the child of a couple for example um so the 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 child or the where it's a parent child relationship <clears throat> and i understand the concern that you're expressing here um i think the difficulty is that in order to capture that in the way you suggest it also capture children who have no relationship essentially um to to the to the the household in question um as you said it could capture other children who just see or hear or are present um and I think that's the that's the area where Veronica has, I think, tried to express the concern that we're talking here um, about a particular course of action that has to be. It has. To, I'm trying to think how, how best to clarify the position that it's not just it's not just any child, but it has to be a child who is directly impacted. So that's that's the point that I'm trying to make um, in terms of what we're doing with respect to the amendment. Um, it was, as I say, an attempt to try to get it. I accept the fact that Rachel's amendment was not a committee amendment, but I'm also aware that there has been lengthy discussion. And with respect to the um, financial um, memorandum, it does not stand part of the bill. It says that clearly on it. And that was what raised my concerns about that being seen as, if you like, a solve to the wider concern, because it wouldn't ultimately provide the committee with the level of so, uh, with the level of clarity um, and the level of robustness um, that the committee appeared to be seeking. And that's why I put in the face of the bill rather than the explanatory memorandum um, to me seem more appropriate um, reflection. Now, I mean, if the committee don't feel that that's appropriate, then obviously I will take that on board. I'm listening carefully to what's being said today because, as I say, this is an ongoing process. It's not, we're not at the end of the road. Um, and I will take that on board. But that was the purpose of moving from a being in the EFM to being in the bill. And we support that. You know, that. Okay. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the paper a lot of it has been gone over. And just <laughs> it is about, um, you know, there's a real disconnect for me still. Um, between the definition of connected person and the breadth of what we're trying to bring into in this bill in terms of those relationships. And then this notion of residency just jars with that. I, I don't see any consistency or flow in that. And I, um, I know the minister you referred there to that there is always that sort of residency notion in the background because this is domestic and it's referring to units and relationships, but I'm not sure that it is there. I, I, I think this um, addition of residency really doesn't flow through this bill. You know, I, I don't see it in other parts, and I remain to be convinced that it fits. I can see how it did fit in the Scottish legislation because their parameters were much um, tighter and smaller in terms of, you know, who the connected persons could be, but I just remain to be convinced of that. And I don't know if there's anything more you can say to me at this point that would throw more light on that. 
Shania, does it maybe helpful if I try and give some further explanation in relation to that residency aspect? And I suppose building on what the minister has said, uh, you know, as, as, as you'll be aware, the other elements in relation to the aggregator, there isn't the condition of the individuals living together. So essentially, and, and as we say, those are intended very much for those situations where the child is in the house, sees the behaviour, um, you know, so in, in terms of, of this reasonable person aspect, it is intended very much to try and deal with that wider environmental impact in relation to how the relations between two individuals um, bears out on the child more generally. I suppose the concern would be that if we don't have this residency impact, so for example, if, if you, you take the scenario where um, individuals are living in, in two terrace properties, there's kind of argy-bargy every night in the property next door. It could be argued that that abusive behaviour has an adverse impact on that child, albeit that they're not in that household. And I suppose our concern is that we, we need, in, in some respects, I suppose, to try and ensure that we're dealing with that behaviour that impacts most upon a child. And what we don't want to have is a situation where basically any um, indirect behaviours between any individuals where there is some connection to a child could potentially be brought to bear in terms of the offence, a person being um, having increased sentencing in relation to that offence. So as I say, the, the focus of the reasonable person aspect is very much to try and reflect where it is indirect behaviours that adversely impacts on a child in the context of the environment um, within which they're being brought up. If, if if that's in, of any help in, in terms of trying to provide some further clarity on the thinking on that. Thank you, Edward, but I think it, it requires a bit more investigation on my part, but thank you. Can I just ask, the, the comments that this offence needs to be occurring in a domestic setting, where, where in the bill does that exist? And indeed, the bill actually makes provision in Clause 10 for these offences outside of the United Kingdom, an issue that we had to get legal advice on. So, Minister, you, you said that this yeah. offence takes place in a domestic setting. Where's that? No. Well, I, I didn't say that, actually. What I'm saying here is that the, the context of domestic abuse, by virtue of its name, means that there is an element of domestic and familial relationship um, within this setting. So that is, if you like, the scope of the offence that we're creating. It is not explicit in the bill because we accept that that abuse can take place in other settings. So it, to be domestic abuse, it doesn't have to happen in a house. So that's the first thing to, to clarify. So that's not what I was implying. I was simply implying that there has to be this familial relationship. It's not just general abuse of another individual. Um, and that there, there is, that's the scope of the bill. Otherwise, we would be capturing things that are not domestic abuse, whilst there may be inappropriate behaviours, and they may even be criminal behaviours, um, that wouldn't fall under the scope of the bill. Okay, I think that goes then to so the. So that helps to clarify, and it's not my intention to suggest that people need to be resident in particular premises for this to apply. Just okay. to be clear. No, well, we appreciate that, and I think that's where it goes to the issue then as to why this amendment has a residency issue attached to it because that's not yes. anywhere reflected anywhere in the bill. Um, yeah, and I understand that point has been made um, today, and I will reflect on that um, with officials. I think Veronica has tried to set out the rationale for that in terms of, if you like, lower impact offences, which could then carry quite a heavy um, sentence um, as a result of the child aggravator and so on being applied, um, where someone non-resident and um, being being witness to something that is happening or hearing something that is happening, present something is happening, but not, if you like, as a, as a course of action. But we will reflect on what the committee has said because that was the purpose um, of me seeking this meeting today because I want um, to understand better um, exactly where the particular issues um, on this are. So I, that helpful to me. Well, I suppose now I'm just repeating what Linda said. The committee did reach a position on this um, and we didn't accept at the time Rachel's amendment um, we, and, and we had consensus outside of, of Rachel's position. Um, but the information on which that decision has been based has now changed because of the doubt that has been raised by your intervention. As such, um, then it becomes an individual decision for political parties. The, the committee is no longer bound to a committee decision on that basis. So um, e even if you remove your amendment, um, it's past the post 
uh, in terms of uh, a committee position to be able to be taken at this stage now. So just to be yes, I, I no, I understand that. I mean, the issue, as I say, Chairman, was particularly in respect of the uh, um, explanatory and financial memorandum. I mean, it simply would not have provided the reassurance that we had indicated, I believe, to the committee that it might. Um, and on reflection, therefore, I didn't feel that given the importance that the committee had placed on that particular issue, that it was an appropriate vehicle um, to resolve the issue. Okay. Members, if there's no other members on, on Clause 9, Minister, do you want to take us through Clause 11 then, that, that issue? Well, if I could take, to, uh, could take 11 and 17, because I know the committee wished to discuss them and they are linked in with the new clause in relation to the child cruelty offence. Yeah, sure. Um, as members are aware, um, the evidence received by the committee during their deliberations highlighted concerns that not physical behaviour of a child um, by someone with parental responsibility for them was not captured by the current child protection provisions. In order to respond to this, an amendment will be made to the Child Cruelty Offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1968 to make it clear that non-physical treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is an offence. This offence applies to those under the age of 16. Amendments are also brought forward in relation to clauses 11 and 17 as a result of this. Clause 11, as it currently stands, provides that the domestic abuse offence does not apply where a person has parental responsibility for someone under 18 years of age. <coughs> I have tabled an amendment to this clause which will change the age from under 18 years to under 16 years of age. This is to ensure that non-physical behaviour of a 16 to 18 year old by someone with parental responsibility is captured by the new offence. This is necessary given that section 20 of Children and Young Persons Act 1998, assuming the amendment passes, would capture non-physical ill treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them, only applies to persons under 16 years of age. To do otherwise would mean that those aged 16 to 17 would not be protected in terms of non-physical abusive behaviour. The change to clause 17 is for the same reason. So while the ill treatment or abuse of a child or young person falls into the child protection arena, what it is important to ensure at this point is that the necessary protections are afforded to all young people. We can obviously debate whether or not the child cruelty offence should have a threshold of under 18 as opposed to under 16, but we can't provide for that within this bill. My focus is on ensuring that abusive behaviour against children can be dealt with by whichever means are available. For that reason, I have amendments to make explicit that the child cruelty offence covers both physical and non-physical ill treatment of those under 16, while extending the domestic abuse offence to those aged 16 and 17. Without these changes, there would be no protections in place for those who are 16 and 17. We have liaised, obviously, with the Department of Health officials in this respect, and we have also, obviously, I have liaised with Robin um, Swan in respect. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Of, of these um, particular elements because they impinge on his responsibilities uh, with respect um, to child protection. Um, and he has responded positively um, to say that he is supportive of the approach that we have taken. Okay. <coughs> members, is there any questions members want to raise around the 1816 issue? I know it's, it's an area that we did discuss um, but we didn't have sight of the amendments at that time. But if members have any more clarity that they need around the 18 to 16 issue, feel free to. Uh, Sinead Bradley. Mm -hmm. Hello, if the broadcasting people can bring in Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I followed this with Minister McNen, but does she have any concerns about the sentencing um, not being equal in this regard? Obviously, then, we direct the group to a different um, legislative avenue, and the sentencing available on that may be distinctly different. And I understand, um, in terms of penalties, I think what's important is the net 
necessary protections and safeguards are in place to address non-physical abuse behaviour against children. So I think that's that the priority. Um, this is provided through the amendments um, to the child cruelty offence, as well as lowering the threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion. Children under 16 are being dealt with under health child protection legislation, where the penalties associated with a, a, a maximum of 10 years have been in place for some time. I understand the point um, that you make, Sinead, but as Justice Minister, I can't alter this, and any changes would have wider ramifications for the Department of Health, who have primary uh, policy responsibility in that area. So it would be for the Minister of Health um, to bring forward any change in terms of the penalty. For the domestic abuse offence provisions, this could cover not only physical abusive behaviour, but also include serious violent and sexual assaults, which is why the reflected penalty is 14 years, because that reflects, if you like, the, the current um, sentencing structures that would apply um, to similar offences um, within the justice sphere. So the difficulty with this is because we're having to use two vehicles and there is no alternative, unfortunately, um, for us to be able to do this by one um, simple means, um, it would, we, would be, we would essentially not be able to change the penalties um, under child um, health child protection legislation. Uh, and that's the fundamental issue. And it may well be that the committee um, are, are, you know, would want to write to the, the Committee for Health to see whether or not um, the Minister of Health might want to look and review the penalties within their framework. And that is something where I am happy to assist the Minister um, if, if that's something he wants to do. But I can't do that on his behalf because it's beyond the scope of my department and this bill. Thank you. I appreciate that, Minister. Thank you. Okay, Sinead, thank you. Okay, if there's no other clarity needed on those areas, uh, Minister, do you want to move on then to addressing the, the committee amendments? Yes, Chairman. Um, first of all, um, with respect to the committee's amendment of the guidance around data collection, um, as you were aware, I'm content with that amendment. Um, I would intend to bring forward an amendment at further consideration stage. Um, because there are some issues around the organisational names referenced in the provision that the committee um, has brought forward. They will be pretty minor technical changes and we will share those with the committee um, as soon as we have them available to us. Um, so that's on the data collection. With respect to enabling information sharing with schools, we are in agreement there is considerable merit in provision being made that will enable information um, to be shared with schools for the purpose of Operation Encompass approach. Um, as noted, um, I think I have withdrawn my amendment uh, and provision we believe can be made at further consideration stage um, for some of the concerns that I had in that regard. I want to stress my amendment was intended to build on and enhance the committee amendment through providing increased clarity and certainty as to what the regulations will contain and to ensure provisions are as robust as possible. Expanded enabling powers would be more targeted. Um, being explicit that the regulations can set out who information could be shared with and to what is deemed a school or college, who are pupils or students, what a domestic abuse incident is, the circumstances in which information is shared, unauthorised closure, and the offences associated with it. So I want to ensure that the necessary scope and authority is provided to take forward the detail of the regulations more clearly, setting out what will be provided for within regulations and who, what, why and when. There's also the issue of the virus to take forward some aspects of the regulations without this signposting. For example, to enable college, um, colleges to be captured and also to be able to provide for offences and penalties associated with provisions, um, for example, where there is a breach and there is unauthorised disclosure. In the absence of this, there might be a question as to whether it's within the Assembly's legislative com uh, competence. Um, so also needed um, in, uh, of any infringement of Article 8 of the Human Rights Convention, the right to respect for private and family life. Again, my amendment would seek to address these issues, build upon and strengthen the provisions and minimise the risk of the enabling provision not being sufficient for collective purpose. I'm hopeful that the committee would welcome this and therefore hope that we would be able to reach an agreed position when it comes to further consideration stage um, in regards to Operation Encompass. 
With respect to the reporting requirements, which I think is Amendment 21, again, agreement that there is merit in reporting on the operation of the provisions of the bill. As noted, I've withdrawn my amendment, but consider that there should be some amendment for further consideration stage. Again, the intention here is to build on and strengthen the committee amendment changes primarily to refine some of the language around criminal proceedings so that it more closely aligns with practice. The amendment further consideration stage would technically be quite different given that there will be a substantive committee provision in place. This person is known starting from sheet. So although we have withdrawn our amendment, it will not come back in the same form. However, the intent would be the same as my previous amendment 21. So I hope that that makes sense. Um, members will also wish to note that additional provisions in relation to recording of poli uh, police offences as well as submitted to and cases the public prosecution service. Um, I note that the suggestion um, from Rachel Woods of recorded offences by police district is helpful and so I would, if the committee are minded, I would intend to support that at consideration stage next week. Um, and also, to, I agree that there's more for clarity, stating numbers where the offence has been aggravated and proved as such. In terms of provisions around the experience of witnesses and arrangements of business in court, I think that these would be more appropriately considered in terms of the three categories of offences as a whole rather than by the individual categories. In relation to the guidance aspect, my amendment had reflected that at the provisions commencing, the guidance will have been finalised to publish, therefore focuses on review and revision. The wording around the time period for reporting is designed to reflect the fact that for official statistical publications, these typically require around six months from the chosen end date. Finally, um, I have some concern with the requirement that there be ongoing reporting on a long-term basis. This isn't something that has been done for any other offence, and it could set a resource-intensive precedent for other areas with new material offences coming forward. And so I would question the benefit of that um, when the offence has bedded in. Um, I'm not sure, um, Chairman, if, if you wish me to continue um, with with the remaining bits of Rachel's Amendment 27, dealing with Section 75 information um, on victims and offenders, um, or whether you wish to point which is covered if you like the, the agreed committee um, position. If, if you can just pick up for my benefit Minister the amendment you've indicated um, Rachel Woods's amendment around breaking it down to district that kind of information yes. uh, because the reason I ask that is I appreciate that around the reporting of this there's likely to be an amendment at further consideration stage to cover you know, a number of these points what I am wanting to know is why, at this stage, would you be supporting Rachel Woods' amendment around that aspect to do with policing, just so that I know, because going into okay. next week I knew what my position was going to be, but, but oh. that might change if, if well, you can give well, me a good well, reason. Well, my reason, my reasoning was that I didn't was of existing um, an amendment which I was going to sort um, provide for, um, in that there, there's no if you like caused by accepting the amendment that Rachel has proposed in terms of recording the offences by police district. I actually think that that is a helpful um, recommendation, and so I'm happy um, to accept that amendment at consideration stage next week. Um, and also think that there is merit for clarity, stating numbers, being aggravated, and so on. Um, so it's it's simply that I don't wish to resist amendments where I believe there is more in them. And what I'm trying to do, um, I suppose, at this stage is to get those in at consideration stage where possible um, and then to refine um, at further consideration stage. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but yeah, we no. certainly see that there is there is more um, but, in that and therefore wouldn't necessarily wish to resist it. I suppose that, that's okay, and, and this is not a committee position because we didn't take a committee position. Of course. In terms of where I was in this, I was leaning towards being um, against it, but I had a mark against it to say at further consideration stage, given that there was going to be a wider tidying up exercise, and that, and that was the 
preliminary approach that I was thinking about. Um, so, uh, I, I, and, that, and it's maybe a broader there is, point. There is about obviously, sure. I mean, obviously, Chairman, there is also the remaining aspects of um, Amendment Twenty Seven dealing with Section Seventy Five information um, and so on. And on that one, um, I, I am um, convinced. Um, and so I don't support the second part of Amendment 27. Mm. And I can set out my reasons for that if that is helpful. The specifics um, of that particular element of the reporting by district, um, I, I reckon that. Minister? Sorry, I think our signal might be just on the blank a little bit, Minister. Hopefully it'll uh, oh, No, you're okay. I think you're apologies. You're um, okay. It was it was just to say um that the remaining aspect of Rachel's Amendment twenty seven dealing with section seventy five information, um I I don't support that, um, because I don't um, believe that how we, oh, well I'll run through the reasons for it, but I think on the first part of it, so the part of it that that is about um the the, the reporting by police district, I, I am happy with that and I'm content um, to accept that. On the remaining part about dealing with Section 75 information on victims and offenders, I'm unclear as to what some of it would be intended. Um, and indeed, I would be concerned um, it in my confidence um, in the justice system if it was in some way appearing to profile people. And I think there is a risk um, of collating data at that level, um, where, for example, you're dealing with potentially quite small cohorts um, of, of individuals um, in Northern Ireland um, and then reporting on that basis. I think while organisations are thinking how reporting on 75 can be improved, I think operational partners have indicated to us they simply cannot deliver on what is recommended and require the involvement of a complete overhaul of their IT systems. So even for them to volition to report which they wish to do um, will, from, from their perspective, require an overhaul of the IT systems for us, the criminal justice system, um, the operation and financial ramifications of which I think you will appreciate are fairly significant. So I think in, in posing additional reports, not all of which necessarily benefit victims materially, um, we, we would end up expending resources. Um, that won't be available for measures that can substantially help them. So I don't support the second part of Amendment 27, just to clarify. Okay, no, that, that's helpful for my information. But Linda wanted to ask just on those just, um, Amendment 28, I think. Just a very quick, quick question, Minister. Um, in relation to the number of offences recorded within each police district. Is that something that has a convers that you've had a conversation with the PSNA around can it actually be done? If it can, I mean I think that's obviously potentially a positive move, but has there has a conversation been had with yeah, the I'm assuming they'd have to be yes, able to do that. In terms of in terms of the reporting requirements we have spoken to operational partners about what they can and can't deliver in terms of the statistics mm. and in terms of reporting requirements. Um, and we have liaised with them both in terms of what the, the, the proposals um, that are there on the field, the bill, and amendments that have been brought. Um, Veronica, maybe, I mean, I think Veronica obviously has, as you know, um, in, in the discussions, for example, Section 75 reporting, um, the feedback that we have received directly from the, our partners um, is that that is something that they can't do because they don't have um, the capacity within their reporting systems and computer systems to record that level of data without major changes to the system. Whereas, for example, recording by police offences by police district um, is something that is operationally more manageable um, and therefore I think it's something that could be helpful. Additional information for us um, just in terms of particular issues. Um, so, Veronica, do you maybe want to just, um, talk a little bit about um, the the discussions um, that you have had at a kind of official level uh, with the partner organisations? Yes, that's no problem. We actually had a meeting with Veronica, the justice organisations this morning as part of our um, domestic abuse operationalisation task and finish group. That's meeting on a three-weekly basis at the moment. This is kind of a an ad hoc one to look at the, the data collection issues more generally and, and certainly the indication that we're getting as, as the Minister has alluded to is that it should be possible to provide that information on a, a district basis. I, I think there's a range of information that 
currently is, is provided in that sense. So as, as the Minister alluded to, you know, we have shared these amendments um, and, and the provisions with our criminal justice partners more generally to take their views on, on what is or isn't doable. In terms of the Section 75 aspect, my understanding is that, broadly speaking, information tends to be collected on a suspect basis. Um, there is some information in relation to victims, but certainly it would be quite difficult for the likes of um, uh, courts and, and PPS in particular. Um, they don't collect that information at present in relation to victims, and they certainly don't collect the, the range of, of information that um, would be required in relation to that Section 75 provision. My understanding is that there are conversations and discussions ongoing in terms of how that situation can be approved, um, and I think certainly police appear to be at a, a more advanced stage in relation to that. Can I just ask a quick question and, and just a, a very, I suppose, straightforward answer would be appreciated. In relation to the Section 75 stuff, previously on the Policing Board where we had asked for Section 75 um, to be included, and for the same reasons that Rachel's asking for it here, to be fair, is because without statistics, how do you, how do you, how do you resource things, how do you direct resources, and we're always asked for statistics. But in fairness to the PSNA, what they had said is some of it would be very simple. For example, you may easily be able to see that somebody has a physical disability. You may easily be able to see that somebody is is coloured, somebody is from an Asian uh, background and, and things like that. But how would you establish, unless somebody gave you the information, if someone is gay, bisexual, if someone has a mental health issue, so they're, they're, you know, if someone has a communication disability, so if they have Asperger's, autism, all of those things are not obvious. And I'm not arguing against what Rachel's saying. To be fair, I'm just wondering: is there, if, if a way has been found around that, I'd like to know because I would like to share it with my colleagues on the policing board because I'd like it to be used no. in a wider sense. We're resisting that amendment, Linda. To to be clear, we're saying we don't accept that part of the amendment because we don't believe that the Section 75 can be collated in the way that it has asked. Yeah, oh, that's fair enough. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you. That, that sort of clarifies my question. So, am I right? You, the department, won't be supporting Amendment 27. Is that right? Yeah. Sinead, I think we're content yes. on the first aspect of it, around the, the yes. activation, but not on the Section 75 aspect. So as the Minister said, we're content in relation to the, the first bit, but not the second half. Okay, but that will be presented as one amendment, yeah. Amendment 27. I suppose if you look at it as Amendment 27 in its entirety, we, we couldn't support it because we don't support that second part. But what we would want to do is to bring that first element um, into the provisions that we would bring forward at further consideration stage, so that it yeah. the aggregation and it be improved. No, that, that's fine. I understand that. Thank you. Okay. Paul Frey, uh, thank you, uh, Minister Infonica. Thank you for your time. Uh, your, your, your amendments around the contact orders and court proceedings, they're, they're very... They're a very thick read, uh, so I haven't got through them all. Uh, but one of the big aspects this committee was dealing with was the way in which people, perpetrators probably, in fact, certainly, uh, use court proceedings as a weapon. Can I ask you then, out of all of those amendments, and probably particularly Amendment 29, factors relevant to residents and court contact orders, uh, and then also if you could give us your your basic your your basic what it does on the tin aspect, but also if you could give commentary around Rachel Woods's amendment amendment number fourteen around the requirement for civil legal aid, because one of the one of the reasons why perpetrators use the court as a weapon is to run down the resources of the victim, and I'm wondering do you, what, what what's commentary. The department's commentary around Amendment Number 14 under Rachel Woods' name and how you see that working out. And I, pre Paul, I, I appreciate. Chairman, before I, I know I appreciate that. Chairman, before we do so, Chairman, before we, we do that, could, could I suggest that we finish dealing with the committee amendments because I think it's important that we we complete that. Um, there's also an element of training, um, and there's a further element in terms of it. 
okay. for yes, I, our I was, committee yeah, amendments, okay. and I want to discuss our approach to those. And then I'm happy for Veronica to come back on those two points that, that Paul has raised, if that would be okay. That's yes. fine. Sorry, that, sorry about that, you took, you took the words out of my mouth, the important <laughs> questions Paul has, but I know, <laughs> I know we, you were midway addressing the committee amendments, so if you want to do that around those, yeah. the, the rest okay, of them, then you. that would be great. Thank you. I, I don't mean to take over your position as far, so apologies. Okay. I'm just conscious that I leave these hanging. Um, in terms of training, we are agreement that we're in agreement with the committee that training is key for those involved in the operational the oper operationalization of this offence. I hope that you're reassured that work is currently being progressed by the police and PPS in conjunction with voluntary community sector partners um, in terms of developing training programs. Um, specifically um, around this issue. Um, so I don't disagree with the importance of this. For As you will be aware, I do have serious concerns are really being placed on my department in to operationally independent organisations and the precedent that that would set not only for any future Justice Minister but also for other Executive Ministers by placing legislative areas which are effectively outside their remit. The committee amendment places a duty on my department for the training of independent entities over which I have no control. Indeed, in relation to the public prosecution service would, subject to the view of the speaker, require a cross-community vote at the final stage because it interferes with the independence of the director of the prosecution service. The appropriate locus is within the organisations themselves to determine precisely what is needed on operational requirements. I would first I mean, firstly I would welcome the committee's agreement that we should place the onus on the organisations rather than on my department because I think you place me in an invidious position where you're asking me to direct bodies that I am also in law required to respect their independence. My amendment um, this is duty uh, duty on the police, the public prosecution service and the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service to provide training as they consider appropriate on part one of the act. That would cover the organisations with the key responsibility for criminal proceedings on the domestic abuse offence. I would question the merit of going beyond that uh, in terms of um, the scope of the training provided, though it would not obviously preclude, preclude other parts of the criminal justice system uh, from having further training regard. The reference to mandatory in the committee's amendment appears unnecessary as the duty by the provision would be mandatory. More importantly, the amendment may seriously jeopardise the committee's intent. There is a risk that by including long-term recurring training requirements, and due to the onerous, um, the onerous uh, burden that that will place on organisations, that this could inadvertently become a an across-the-board tick box exercise, rather than and focus training that we all agree is needed and that, for example, the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Police are currently trying to scope out um, with, um, with, uh, uh, with the um, third sector partners. Furthermore, operational partners have indicated that the obligation in the committee amendment poses significant problems from a capacity and resourcing perspective. Um, understand that for the Public Prosecution Service this could potentially amount to a full-time post, taking resources away from other training requirements, whilst for the PSNI it could have a wider impact capacity in terms of operational policing, taking finite resources away from other key areas. At present I understand the PSNI do not undertake annual recurrent training in any area. So with this in mind, my amendment aims to ensure the obligation for training to be undertaken but as considered appropriate by the organisation and targeted at the appropriate areas that need it most. For the reason that I, I also have concerns about imposing annual training on an ongoing basis. It seems disproportionate and not consistent with how a new offence would generally be embedded and it would be very resource intensive in terms of precedent for future factors. I am keen to provide more flexibility to the operational organisations themselves to determine the appropriate of training, by retaining the need to undertake this, and I would be interested in members' views on this because I am concerned um, that inadvertently um, this could actually undermine the purpose um, of 
these amendments and if you like if the intent of the amendment is that people are properly trained um, and fully aware of legislation and also properly supported in terms of being able to be enable it and pursue it then that I think is a point on which we're agreed um, I think that it's also um, tied in with this um, an amendment as you know from Rachel um, on the provision of resources again it is, it is, there is an inability on my department to dictate to operationally independent bodies how their budget is distributed. So it's not about whether or not I provide the resource, but I cannot ring fence the resources of that provision in terms of how it will be spent. Um, and it's not possible for me to do that. And indeed, as um, for the, the, the wider implications of this, more importantly, tail so, into potentially open-ended financial demands on my department um, and the executive has indicated additional funds will not be provided which means that service would be adversely impacted and therefore I can't support um, the which Rachel has brought. Furthermore, to be clear, my department does not fund um, the public prosecution service at any level. Um, they are funded as a non-material by the Department of Finance directly in order that they are completely independent, though part of the just system, completely independent of oversight of my department. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in Doug Beattie. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Minister. I mean, that was, that was very clear. And, and I guess, if I can, the, the whole point of training for us is incredibly important. Because if we if we don't ensure that people understand the issues who are at the coalface dealing with it, then, then the whole legislation in many parts starts to, to, to crumble. Uh, and I absolutely do um, have some sympathy with what you're saying in regards to part one of this clause um, about your department being responsible for uh, that training. Although I do see where there is a, a degree of oversight, but but where I have a real concern is um, I actually think. Um, annually is an important piece to have in there. Um, and, and the police do do annual training. They do annual force protection training. They do annual firearms training. They do annual training where they have to interface with the public on certain issues. So I, I actually think that the, the annual training is something that is really, really important. And, and I don't think it's a huge burden um, because it can be annual training which is linked into other annual training. And it's only for those people as it, as it dictates or uh, in part um, three. And I guess the word mandatory, uh, Minister, and I get your point, but I guess the word mandatory really sets down a marker to make sure that this training um, has been done. Uh, and my concern with, with, with your amendment, if I'm really honest, I, I, it, it looks a little bit weaker. It, it doesn't give me that sense that the training Will, will actually hit what we're trying to get it to hit. So where I would be happy in, in a further consideration stage to look at part one of the clause, and even part four of the clause, I think, probably not quite that workable. I do think that, that um, the annual piece is absolutely fundamental. I think the word mandatory in there needs to stay in there. I think it's an important marker. And I just think that that, that your, amendment, your, your amendment is a, is a little bit weaker in, in the way it's it's, it's been produced, although I'm sure we can cut and paste from, from both to create what we're actually after, after achieving here. Okay, well, that's helpful, Doug. I appreciate that. I mean, the first thing is that I'm happy to work, I mean, depending on obviously what, what, how the committee feels at the end of this session, I'm happy to work with the committee, but it is important to note that we can't, we can't make lesser provisions at further considerations. So, for example, we would not be able to amend some of the issues that you have raised around this if it gets to further consideration stage. So once it says mandatory and annual, um, that can't be diminished. However, just to point out, strictly speaking, what you said is not accurate. This would create an obligation for the police to do mandatory training right across the entire force. So there is no, not that only those officers, for example, uh, who have particular roles would be trained in this or particular domestic abuse um, of, uh, response officers or anything like that. It would be for every single officer from chief constable um, right down to new recruit. Now what the really nice. service and indeed what, what officers are talking about is if you like initial training 
be rolled out across uh, the, 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 their, their set. Um, and then it would be embedded in the regular training that would go in to train a new recruits and, 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 and so on. So that, it, I understand that it looks weaker, but it is the normal way that training regulations are put into um, legislation. Uh, the wording that we have got from the Office of Legislative Council is to ensure that it takes account of the needs of the business areas in those organisations without requiring other parts. I mean, for example, is it entirely required that somebody, for example, work in, in the organised crime section in the SNI annually trained on domestic yeah. abuse? Perhaps so, perhaps not. But I think that the best person to make those decisions is the person in charge of operational policing and training, not, frankly, either me as Minister or yourselves as the Justice Committee. And it is also a matter that at the policing board, um, your colleagues have oversight of in terms of looking at the training regime that, that is applicable. So I understand that it looks like weakening it and that is one of these learned that if we don't address that issue about the deal of being annual and so on, that we will end up in a situation where we place our responsibility on the, those bodies which is, they can't fulfil in the meaningful manner that the committee and would wish and we end up with people, for example, doing a 15 minute online training program on domestic abuse. Now, I don't think that's what any of us would have anticipated it might look like. But unfortunately, if they feel that that is the only way they can afford um, to deliver the training and have capacity to deliver the training that's mandated, it could be reduced to that. And that's where I'm fearful that if we, if we overstretch what we ask for um, and place in the legislation, we will under deliver in terms of the actuality of training. So I suppose what I'm trying to do is not to dispute the importance of training or the requirement that it should be robust and properly delivered. I am recognising that these are independent bodies with their own oversight structures, but also um, with their own operational demands. And what I want to do is find a form of words, if we can, preferably um, that we don't go down a route of, of um, tying this down too tightly um, at the next uh, at consideration stage, in order that perhaps at further consideration stage, we could move an amendment. Um, either the committee or myself um, would be happy to assist with the drafting. Um, we'd allow us to get sufficient robustness without running that risk. That is essentially the proposition. Um, that I'm put because I'm entirely in the same place as the committee when it comes to training, but I'm concerned at the impact of the detail that's included in the amendment. And, and I guess, Minister, and I accept that, and thanks for that full answer. And I, and I guess, in many of what you're actually saying, is is you're kind of right. Um, but but I've been a trainer all my life, and therefore I understand that that you're right in what you say. Every single person within the police service needs to get this training from the chief constable down to the newest recruit. That's not the issue. They have to get that training. And if that's, if that's the, the, the general awareness training that they need to get, and that's a 30-minute online session, then that's the 30-minute online session. Uh, and, and that should be normal practice. Um, what we're really talking about here is what would be classed as that Tier 2 training. And that's that step-up training with those people who are dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis or have an inter interaction on this issue on a day-to-day -day basis where the chief constable wouldn't necessarily and I'm just using him as an example but 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 of another course. but somebody else somebody else would my fear is this minister is that if you leave it as they must do training then they will have a training cycle within recruit training and that will be it nothing more and their their their, their personnel file will say domestic abuse trained uh, at recruit training uh, and that's it. So that, that's my concern. I'm not trying to dictate well, what the annual training no, no. Would, would be. I, I'm just trying to say that, that there needs to be that, that focus of training where people do get that reminder every year, but those people who are in that really sort of busy, in, in your face, cold face place, get that tier two level of training as, as the police deem necessary. Uh, and I think that that's the issue. You said, as the police deem necessary, but 
this will place a mandate that it is at for all officers and as a result of that um, the kind of resource that is available for the more intensive training um, may not really emerge and we may end a suboptimal outcome and that is my concern. So it isn't to say that the police shouldn't be trained. With respect, it is a matter for the policing board then to hold the police to account with respect to how they train the officers, where they train them, how much best in that training. And the difficulty is by putting this in statute, it makes it then difficult, I think, for the for the the, the them to exercise the discussion that you acknowledge there needs to be. So I suppose that's it's not a difference of of view in terms of the importance of training. It's simply a difference of of view as to how we can better deliver it. And I I, I do believe, and I, I don't know what what scope as I say there is. I mean, the committee obviously tabled their amendment. You don't have to move the amendment. I would on some of mine, and I considering um, on a number of others. I'm obviously for the weekend. Um, but if the committee were not to move this amendment. It still will be tabled at further consideration stage, but it would give us the time to further explore this particular issue and perhaps draft an amendment with the department that would better reflect what the committee is actually trying to achieve, which is that those frontline officers who are dealing with this offence day and day um, are fully equipped the detail, but there is wider awareness training across the police um, and the justice sector um, more generally. Um, and that it is like by the needs of the organisations, and I think agreement on this, um, by and large, I don't think that this is about trying out of responsibility for any of things. I think it is simply about, and also obviously fundamentally ensuring the responsibility lies with the right organisation. So I, I, I guess I will leave that committee to consider um, whether there is scope to do that because I'm happy to do that if we can in order to get a robust training um, in the bill, but so in practice. So, so Chair, so it would be helpful if I maybe perhaps make a suggestion. Can I, and, just, and just one second, Veronica, Veronica, just one second, um, because the, the, the Minister has outlined, I think, a position that is reflected already in our amendment. And, and if I can just draw attention to, to specifically its amendment 25A, um, and it relates to what Doug has outlined. You know, there is the tier one type training that's universally applicable. Then there is the tier two for those that are specifically involved in the relevant type of business area that they are transacting. And if you look at 25A3, training is mandatory for all those involved in the disposal of domestic abuse cases in policing and criminal justice agencies, including but not limited to the agencies listed in subsection one. The next part then says. 25A4, having identified the relevant staff in subsection 3, at the beginning of an annual reporting period, the department must publish the uptake of training by each relevant organisation. So our amendment already accommodates this approach that, Minister, you have outlined, where, where I have some sympathy, um, which we could look at uh, once the committee amendments approved by the Assembly. At further consideration stage, I have some sympathy for where the duty lies. but. This is not an amendment okay. which is universally applicable for the same type of training for every single member of staff of every single criminal justice agency. That's so because the committee was alert to the very points and deliberated upon of them course. for a long period of time. Can I can I come in before Veronica as well? Just because mine is only a very quick point, and it's kind of similar to the point that Paul is making, and 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 I agree with with what, exactly with what Paul said because I, I do have actually. Sympathy, a lot of sympathy for the minister's position and as to who gives the training. I suppose just one of the things, and I understand where the minister's coming from around make, ensuring that appropriate training is given, and that is vital. And you're absolutely right in what you're saying. However, that is why we have put it in the in the format in which we have put it. And the minister's right in terms of also in terms of our colleagues in the placing board will hold the place to account in relation to this, and they will. But it will be much easier for them to do so. If there's something here in legislation for them to hold them to account to, because, and in fairness, I, I would have to say there's there's a lot of good work going on within policing, and things have improved immensely in terms of you know that 
accountability and, and police actually listening to the policing board where they think and, and actually in, in many cases they're a step ahead now which is brilliant to see but we still just need to have that wee bit of reassurance that it, if it's in the legislation that the policing board can hold them to account in a way where they, there is no wriggle room where it's there and I accept there will be those which has already been outlined by others in the, on the committee there will be those where it will just simply be an online thing because they're not directly dealing with and, and even those who are directly dealing with, if it's annual, it may just be a refresher, maybe something very, very simple and straightforward. But the policing board will be able to ensure that the appropriate training is being given because they'll have something to hold it, hold them to account against. And it will be for them to decide then, along with the PSNI, whether actually what they're doing is appropriate or not. But they'll have something to hold them to account against, and that's really where we're trying to get to. So I, I understand where the minister's coming from, but. The most just in terms of, of what has been outlined by um, both Doug and Paul, and I know it was very much Rachel's stipulations throughout our conversations as a committee. We what we need to have something to hold people to account to. Sorry, well, I understand. I understand entirely. Look, I don't think the, the gap between us here is huge. No. Um, so on that basis, um, we will we will act again, as I've said at the end of this session. Um, and see if that gap bridged at um, further consideration stage. If not, the last point, um, and it, I, um, there are two more um, um, points uh, that I wish to to just reach um, at this point, and then I'm afraid I will have to conclude the session because executive is now um, being deferred until I can rejoin, um, and that you will be aware of significant public interest in the decisions that are about to be taken. Um, and significant responsibility of us um, in terms of public, um, in terms um, of protecting our economy, and I don't want to shirk those responsibilities um, and at any level. Neither do I want to disrespect the committee, but I do want to through amendments. And if it would be acceptable, could we cover the next two amendments? Um, and then perhaps Veronica could answer the more detailed points, um, respect of other amendments um, from the department, if that would be acceptable. Um, the pendant oversight issue. Um, in discussion um, with the chairs on Friday, I all um, discussed the issue of the um, independent oversight function. Again, we were all agreed oversight and scrutiny. The effect of the new provisions is key. I think the best uh, use could be made of the current scrutiny and oversight functions without having to provide for this as a new and distinct legislative requirement. I was encouraged in our discussions um, about the potential for that independent oversight um, to be um, potentially um, to, to, to um, be placed on, for example, Sajini, um, which is something that we um, have been trying to scope out um, as a department, but also, um, as you would be aware, that my concern um, really stems from two aspects. First of all, um, oversight function um, itself I think is important. My concern is an additional duty to statute, which is not needed. Um, and so I think we've already identified that there are other op options for oversight. I also have some concerns about the nature of the provision, which I set out to the chair and vice chair um, in terms of other offences going forward. Um, I believe that biannual reporting for a more limited time period may be more appropriate. And again, we'd welcome the committee's views on this prior to further consideration stage. Um, again, all of this will considerable staff to support um, in the time when the department still has a significant agenda of work to progress in the domestic abuse space in terms of new initiatives that will have a material benefit um, for those affected by domestic abuse. You will also be aware, um, Chairman, as we, it would be my intention um, that if you save on a Victims of Crime Commissioner, that potentially that person would also have special responsibilities um, in respect of vulnerable victims of crime, and particularly what those may, may be domestic abuse. In that regard, I believe that that person may be best placed in order for people um, who fulfil this role. And again, I would welcome the committee views on that um, in order that I think if we could look at a more time limited period 
um, biannual report um, and potentially um, this being either given to Sajini, which is one body that was considered, um, but potentially to a new Victims of Crime Commissioner um, to ensure that there is no no issue uh, with the timeliness of a do that because that will be able to be in statutory, um, in statutory format um, before the next mandate. Um, but we would hope to have an interim commissioner in place. So I'm really seeking views on that um, in terms of further um, consideration stage. The final issue is in relation to protection for victims. Um, and I understand the committee has concerns that the necessary legislation um, is not introduced to provide for these. I have already indicated to the executive in my intent um, around the scope um, and the uh, content of the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Uh, in that, I have indicated that, that we would enable the detail of the provisions um, for the uh, domestic abuse protection notices and domestic abuse protection orders uh, be able to set out in primary level. Um, as well as the necessary consultation to be undertaken ahead of this. Given the interest in notices and order, the Assembly should have the details set out in primary legislation rather than in regular or secondary legislation and the opportunity to supervise those provisions. I'm also happy um, to ensure that the Committee is cited on the relevant proposed provisions as they are being developed, recognising that we are not likely to be in a position to introduce these um, other than as amendments. So there are three elements uh, of the miscellaneous provisions bill that are in slower time due to pressures on the Office of Legislative Council. This is one of them and there are two others. They will be brought forward subsequently as amendments to the bill, which will be referred to the committee for consideration. However, I would be happy um, to work with the committee in the design of those um, particular provisions so that, if you like, the scrutiny opportunities for the committee are not restricted. I don't think it is therefore appropriate to regulate the secondary legislation an issue which takes the form of about 35 clauses in the Westminster legislation which is in effect a medium size bill in itself. I think that the House should be aware of the intent of the provisions and their authority for what we're intending to do. And in addition, it's at least a two year um, time frame for the introduction of an untested policy which has been subjected to public consultation, I think would expose the department to a successful judicial review and unnecessary levels of risk. Um, in that regard, Mr. Chairman, if your intent uh, will conclude my remarks um, in that respect, um, only to say that if we progress both through the we can know it's something that has been considered, there would be significant resource implications as it would require the department both to consider progress primary and secondary legislation in the same area um, at the same time. And I wouldn't be willing to do that given the time pressures on staff at the minute, um, not least of all given the current pandemic. So with respect to the interim protections for victims, again, I, I don't believe that this is a difference in intent or desire or what where we want to be. I simply think it is a difference in approach and terms of how we get there and I would hope um, that we would be able to reach um, some on this um, again because I think that the risk is um, that we end up expanding resource and detracting um, from the work that we can be doing in the domestic abuse space. Still a lot of non-legislative work that needs to be taken forward which I believe is urgent and a priority and I'm afraid my team are my team. I'm not going to have an army of people coming um, in order to take all of the additional um, pieces forward, including two parallel views, two parallel procedures in relation to the same, um, the same uh, piece of legislation. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate your comments earlier, and that's the committee amendments um, addressed. And obviously, I'll get members just to focus on those two areas of the independent oversight. And the DAPOs, and then uh, I've heard what you've said, Minister. At that point, you, you'll need to go once you've addressed members on those two areas, and then uh, members can pick up with Veronica the other amendments that people might want to question. So, Paul Frew. Yes, Minister. I'll be quick. Thank you. I'll, I'll be quick. Why, why are you comparing uh, a commissioner of victim of victims of crime 
with the independent oversight. Pardon? Why, why are you comparing the Commissioner of Victims of Crime, which you hope to bring in, with the independent oversight? Because they're two different things. I'm not comparing them. I'm saying that one of the roles that the Commissioner could have is view, for example, progress in regard um, to the operationalisation of this offence and would allow them to report on distinct issues in relation to vulnerable group, groups of victims. So that is the purpose. So I'm not saying but I am saying that the Commissioner for Crime, uh, Victims of Crime, with special responsibility um, for domestic abuse could be one mechanism um, for delivering oversight. And I just wanted to, I guess, take the views of the committee on that as we proceed. Uh, you'll know that most of the groups who would have given evidence are disappointed uh, that we fell short of a, a commissioner for domestic abuse. And I get that, I understand that. Uh, but, but surely a, a commissioner for victims of crime will have enough on their plate with regards to actually going into part one of the Domestic uh, Violence and Family Proceedings Bill, they'll have a lot more wide-ranging remit than just the integral parts and the outworkings of this bill. Is that not the case? Well, the purpose, the purpose of the Victims of Crime Commissioner um, what is to, first of all, avoid the need for duplication and multiplication of commissioners, given the expense of commissions and the back office staff and so on that are required for that. I don't believe that that is justifiable and that it would drain resources away um, from actually frontline service provision. But it would be within the capacity of any commissioner um, either to be asked to do a piece of bespoke work in terms of oversight um, or um, to be um, to take it under their own um, responsibilities to decide to do a piece of oversight. I mean, with respect, Paul, there would be no difference between the capacity um, of the commissioner in that regard and the capacity, the, the capacity of criminal justice inspection. For and by that, despite they too have limited resources, um, and so they have attention to different aspects of the criminal justice system and oversight at different times and I would anticipate that the Victims of Crime Commissioner uh, would have the same ability to both respond to particular issues that have been raised with them but also to initiate um, scrutiny um, and oversight where they believe that there is some uh, need to do so and that may be for example the period of opera operationalisation of this offence. So, so just a final, final question. Do, do you not recognise, Minister, uh, as, as I think we do in the committee here, given our amendment, that with this new cutting-edge bill, with this new offence that we are, we are creating, where, where everyone may well struggle to get their, and have been struggling over the last decade, to get their heads around coercive control and how it would play out in the courts, in the police force and the PPS, is it not right that we put a dedicated independent oversight in order to get this off the ground in the right space so that it will make your job easier in the years to come and your department's job easier in the years to come to actually flow away, flow off that and know, know where the standard is set for oversight and then have that, that in itself brings a confidence uh, to victims and the population out there that we have actually got this right and it's performing the way it should. But I'm not disputing that. Um, with respect, what I'm saying is who will do that work? Um, and I have to say that the chair had communicated to me when we met on this issue, because my concern was that what was anticipated here a fixed period under a different name. And I was very reassured um, by the discussion that I had with the chair and the vice chair that that was not their intention. Um, that the intention of the committee was that there would be an independent oversight function, not an independent overseer created, along with an office and staff and everything that would have to go with that necessarily. Um, and in that case, it is then 
say, who would exercise that independent oversight function. And in my previous correspondence to the committee, um, I have suggested criminal justice inspector, our future commissioner with the committee, uh, uh, as well as the role committee itself. So it's the oversight function um, was my understanding. Um, spoken to the vice chair, you now seem to be suggesting that you dependent overseer, which you know is is not the. And was why I was asking the views of the committee um, on different um, as part of this discussion. Yeah, Minister, but someone has to oversee it. Uh, so whether that be the victim of uh, the victim of a crime commissioner, or I'm sick in the committee this afternoon. It's written down in the. I can't. We we're breaking up, Minister. I'm but in the committee's views this afternoon. Uh, sorry, apologies. Um, I'm sick in the committee. This afternoon, on, on that matter, on who the committee—it's um, not particularly ahead of um, discussion um, for next week, but it's an important issue. Yeah, I, are they? That the expectation of the committee is that it's one they're about to bring in to be will do this oversight I, I, body. I, I, yeah, I do. I do think this is something. Oversight. I think this is something that's going to have to play out in the floor of the plenary next week in order to get confidence into the system around this, uh, because obviously the department has a massive role here in, in implementing this amendment if it's passed. So there might need to be some tidying up at further consideration stage on this to get it tight. Uh, but I thank you for your answers, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Minister. My question is just a. Uh, uh a very quick one, just on the depots and, and, and no, the notices and orders. Just in relation to, obviously, I, I accept what you're saying around the, you know, primary and secondary legislation, and maybe I'm missing something, and, and I accept that this that may be the case, but we're not actually. I don't see anything in the amendment that says that what you're bringing forward in the miscellaneous provisions bill wouldn't wouldn't suffice to meet the requirements of that amendment. So uh, we're not actually asking for something separate to be brought forward, and maybe it looks like we are. Maybe there's something I'm missing that we've asked for. I'm not sure, but I, I'm, oh, I'm a little okay. confused I, I can, Yeah, I can. I can clarify. It is given the department um, the power to do it by regulation, so by secondary legislation, and it is also <coughs> doing so placing a time limit on when that has to be achieved. And so, essentially, by doing so, um, and because of the risk um, of us then having failed to deliver and being open to judicial review, if for whatever reason, and we, if, if, if there has ever been a time when we understand that circumstances are often beyond our control, even with the best will in the world, if there were, um, for any say in that legislation being passed, a primary legislation, um, then we would fail to um, and could be open to you. And so that places an onus on us to develop this as regulation forward on that basis um, in order that it doesn't have to go through full scrutiny powers and, and through, through full committee stage and all of the rest to ensure that it can be done within the two-year time frame. The difficulty with, first of all, I don't think it's appropriate for something this complex uh, the work we haven't actually done development work um, that's required in terms of consultation and policy development. Um, and I also don't think that it's appropriate that there wouldn't be the adequate scrutiny um, at the committee. But when you put a, a stop in and say that that and I can't con chamber the miscellaneous provisional, we could go through I think we've just lost the signal to the minister there. Just talking away. It's all on you, Veronica. Nobody's here. It's all on you. <laughs> um, maybe while the minister tries to, to reconnect, um, but 
Veronica, is it not my understanding that the department wrote to the committee to say that you weren't actually bringing forward the DAPOs in the legislation in the miscellaneous justice bill, that actually you were going to do it by way of an amendment? Which would then that was the indicate that just given the stage that we're at with everything that's on with um, the, the current workload, it will be provided for in the miscellaneous provisions bill, but it wouldn't be in the bill on introduction. Um, we would hope to go out to consultation shortly um, on that, and, and we'll obviously want to have and um, to work closely with the, the committee in, in terms of uh, the shape of those provisions going forward, and um, you know to be able to have those ongoing discussions with the committee in relation to the nature of them. But I think that the minister's key point is really around ensuring that um, that those provisions are on the face of primary legislation rather than being relegated to secondary legislation. I suppose it just goes to the point, though, of having it in the bill as introduced, because if it's not on the face of the bill as introduced, then, of course, we can't carry out a committee con consideration stage, um, which is the, the reason why the Minister is arguing against our approach to, to allow that all to happen. That wouldn't happen through an amendment that would be brought by the Department. I think certainly in relation to that, and I suppose it's of, if it's of any reassurance, um, and I fully appreciate that in terms of it, it not being there for the, the committee stage, I think the minister would be quite keen to um, to be working closely with the committee and to be bringing those amendments forward to the committee so that they could be considered as that, that process is going forward, albeit that the, the amendments wouldn't be in place um, for that to be considered as part of the formal committee stage. Okay. Um, is there any other members want to ask questions just on the independent oversight and the... Um, the other aspects of the, the two committee before we, we No. No. Okay. Um can I can I ask Veronica and maybe I'm being unfair in Rachel because it's her amendment, but uh, see the, the amendment in respect of the civil legal aid. Um, has the yeah. has the department had an opportunity to to look at that and what the the implications of it would be? Certainly, I'm, I'm, it's not my area, and equally in, in terms of the, the query that Paul had put forward, it's not my area, but I'm, I'm more than happy to try and address that as, as best I can in, in terms of um, you know, what my knowledge is in, in relation to it. In terms of the civil legal aid change, you know, obviously my understanding would be that that's stemming from a concern in relation to proceedings being taken forward in, in relation to contact orders um, and mm. the, the financial implications for individuals in relation to that. Um, I think from a, a departmental perspective, you know, what I would say is that this amendment is obviously put it in the face of primary. I've been advised that there is already provision in secondary legislation that would enable this to be taken forward. So if the decision were to be made and the department was accepting of that, there isn't a need for a, a primary legislative change in relation to that. I suppose so the, the key issue is really around the um, cost factor associated with that. Um, I'm not aware of what the, the, the specific figure is, but certainly my understanding is that it's very significant sums of money um, that would be involved in relation to that civil legal aid amendment. Um, you know, I, I think potentially into double figure millions and, and potentially uncapped in terms of the, the size of the quantum of it. Um, you know, obviously it's, it's something that the minister will touch on um, in the debate next week. And as I say, it, it's, it's not my area, so I'm not able to give a particularly detailed answer, but. That's my understanding in terms of the position in relation to that. There is already a provision that would allow this to be taken forward without a change to primary legislation, should the department be so minded. Uh, but, but the major issue is, is really the, the quantums of um, monies that would be involved in relation to this, which would be very, very considerable, um, you know, given that it's a, it's a, a, a wide power. OK. Um, Paul Frew. Yeah, just so, so we're, we're clear, and, and so I'm clear, th this, would, this would add a discretion uh, onto onto the judge, if you like, in the, the civil legal services in the, in the in the court proceeding to allow this to happen. How, 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 and I know it's not your area of expertise, Veronica. Uh, where is the evidence you're reading from with regards to the millions, the tens of millions? Because it strikes me to be very high, if if that is the case. Further work would obviously need to be done in relation to this, but the sense that I was getting from legal aid colleagues was that potentially the cost associated, and, and they would have referred to it rather than tens of millions, they would have referred to this being an uncapped cost. Um, and as you say, albeit that it is a discretionary power, but I think the experience has been previously that while there is discretion, um, there will very quickly be legal challenges, which would essentially limit 
the extent to which there is discretion, if that makes sense. So whether there is technically a discretionary power, um, you know, the, the legal challenge and unsuccessful challenge of that would end up meaning that that, that effectively it, it would be granted. So, so um, it, it's it's something, as I say, you know, the minister will want to discuss in more detail next week. But well, that, that's my understanding in relation to that provision. Okay, one second. If the broadcast and can bring the minister the, the minister back in from the audience, would appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my apologies. My um, internet connection went down okay. and unfortunately I fell off the call. So apologies. Um, I'm going to have to now um, leave because Executive has started um, nine minutes ago and I'm conscious um, that we, we, we have to get difficult decisions taken today. Um, so I apologise. There was no disrespect. Um, it was internet problems. But I will now have to leave. But if members are happy, first of all, thank you for being willing um, to listen to the case um, today um, and I appreciate members time um, this afternoon and hopefully um, I will see you in the chamber next Tuesday and um, we will move this forward but I would like um, if at all possible um, to look at further consideration stage amendments as quickly as we can get them um, drafted um, in order to have the committee's view on those before we move um, to that stage. Okay, no, thank you, and I appreciate your time and wish you well in the executive we'll meeting. Thank you. We'll meet you sorry for a coffee, Mr. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, sorry, Paul, um, you, you were yes. just picking up so, this issue again. So, with so, so if, if the figure is millions, that, that illustrates to me that this is, now, this is a massive problem. Because if we're saying that now this could tip the balance, the cost uh, of legal aid, well, then, it tells me straight away that there's a massive amount of abuse going on there, whereby perpetrators are using the court to push through victims through court process after court process. And, of course, the more court process there is, the more cost that that would be. So what you're saying is that, yeah, this is a massive problem, but it's just too costly to solve. Nearly. If you know what I mean. No, I get where you're coming from, Paul. As I say, unfortunately, this really is beyond kind of the the, the boundaries of of my knowledge and expertise. But as I say, that that's certainly what um, legally aid colleagues were were indicating in, in relation to me in, in terms of what might be the the situation in relation to the amendment. I think there's also something of a concern in relation to the linkage in with domestic abuse in the bill um, per se. Um, you know, there's that obviously could potential, and, and I suppose a a potential concern in, in terms of how that may be used in order to try and avail, if this were passed, how that might be used in order to try and avail of free legal aid for want of a better phrase. Yeah, and that's something that we have to guard against, there's no doubt about that. And it couldn't be, a, a, it may well, there's dangers there about opening it to abuse. But you imagine if we're talking about tens of millions, that's some amount of victims. That's some amount of victims who are getting minimum wage, who are on nurses' salaries, who are, uh, at, you know, hairdressers, all of that, That's, that, that clocks up to some amount of victims that are currently going through a court process and having to use dwindling resource. That, that's scary, actually, if we're talking about figures in that, in that, that field. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to bring in Linda. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Um, I know this isn't, as, as, as you've already outlined, your area of expertise, Veronica, so to be fair, I'm not actually going to ask you for any answers in relation to it. I suppose just to make a point, I think, well, Paul's already made it, if, if that's the kind of money you're talking about, and I know I've dealt with a number of cases, and we actually did have a number of witnesses who wanted us to include parental alienation in the, the legislation, which we resisted because we were fearful that there would be unintended consequences. And I actually think this is the potential way to deal with some of their concerns yeah. because that's exactly what was happening, where victims were being repeatedly taken back to court in relation to contact um, orders and, and the abuse of actual of that of the court system in that way and the abuse of them financially. And very often it's, it's the people Paul talked about. It's the people who are the working poor. They're on low income, they're entitled to nothing, they're entitled to no benefits, no help with their kids, no preschool meals, no help with uniforms, nothing. And then they're fighting constantly and every penny that they're earning is 
and going into constant debt trying to protect their children and I think that that's you know it's an indictment on us that we're not doing something to, about that so my Linda, inclination would you possibly want to be looking at doing and as I say it, it's not my area it's, it's not for me to decide in relation to this but if, if something were to be taken forward in this field what you would want is that you have all of the necessary evidence a look at what the costings may be how you ensure that there isn't a, you know you would want to go through that kind of um, that policy development and, and decision making process and ensure that that was as robust as possible before any changes were, were being introduced. I suppose the concern with the amendment as it is at the moment is that that piece of work hasn't been undertaken no. um, in relation to what it may look like and I suppose what protections and safeguards could be put in place. I, I understand what you're saying Veronica but you, you're 100% right it hasn't been done, it hasn't been taken forward, we have no guarantee unless we put something into this bill that it will be done if we put this in, that doesn't prevent this from being later impacted, you know, in an overall review. And and I actually think that, if I'm being honest, I'd much prefer to see this being dealt with, as part of an overall review and really getting down, to, you know, into the nitty gritty of it. But I think we all know that there is a there's a serious issue here. There's I don't think there's any member of this committee hasn't dealt with people that are in these circumstances. And can I say I'm going to let them keep swinging in the wind? because a piece of work hasn't been done by the department or by us as an assembly and we're all responsible so i think at this point we need to take a bit of responsibility and start looking after these people and for that reason and i, and, and I get everything you're saying and i'm not opposed to what you're saying i actually think that it's they're all well-made points but that's the position i'm at i don't think anything that you're going to be able to say is going to change my mind in relation to it at this time to be fair to you and and it, I just think that, that that is where we're at. There's nothing to stop again the, the department from bringing forward any amendments to this amendment. And if there's something that can improve it in terms of not allowing that abuse or not allowing this to become something that swallows up the department's budget and has you know implications for other areas, this is an area that I, I, I just say is too important. And it is about protecting people who are trying to protect their children. And that's what this bill is about people who are trying to protect themselves and their families. Thank you, Veronica, I appreciate your comments. Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, um, Veronica, I do appreciate this is not the area I too would like to question where the double figure of millions came from. Um, reflecting on Paul's point, um, if, it, if that's actually what has come from Legal Services Agency, then we have a massive problem on our hands that we have completely ignored. Um, and, and, you know, in the years before us, if, the, if this is in the double, mi double figure of millions in terms of legal aid, then wow, you know, this is really, really serious for people. Um, in terms of just, um, I would certainly would welcome if there is any, you know, information on where that came from, if it was legal services or if it was elsewhere within the department, I would welcome that. Um, but in terms of the the, the safeguards. The safeguards are already in place. This is a very, very complex area of the criminal justice system. Um, I have found it very difficult to get my head around, even in researching this amendment. This amendment took many different forms before it went to this. But this already happens for non-molestation orders. It's the same process. It goes through. You know, there's so many checks and balances. So I am, and I can. I'm more than happy to to have. You know, have a discussion with anybody on this um, in terms of the amendment and what, what it does and what it doesn't do. But this is a discretionary power. I don't, at the moment, I would love, again, more information in terms of if there would be um, a challenge to the discretionary power, because it currently exists for non malls. So, is there continuous challenges to the non malls, or where, where does that sit? You know, how many non mall station orders have been challenged on the basis of the discretionary power of the director? So in term, that's why it's discretionary and that's why that clause of the Amendment 14 is worded the way it is. Um, so and the checks and balances for me are already there because the process already exists. And I would love, I, certainly in, in my research, um, I didn't come across double f millions. Um, and even if it is double millions, we need to address it. It's even more pressing. Um, so that's that's all I have to say on Can that. Can I just add something to the, the point that, that Rachel's actually just made in relation to that issue around the risk of legal challenge to it being discretionary? 
the very point we're trying to address here is that these people can't afford to take legal sure. cases. The chances of them taking something that they don't know whether they're going to win and is not any longer about protecting them and their families, we know is pretty slim. Because I know people who have been really badly done by in terms of non-molestation. It's, it's something I raised at the very beginning of this bill. It, it's a, one of my biggest concerns. And they're in no position to take any case around the discretionary power on it. Veronica, can I, can I ask a question from the department? I think you alluded to it. In terms of the, the people that would be covered by this, should the Assembly pass it, you mentioned that it, it may not cover everyone in, a domest, in terms of domestic abuse. I think that's what you said. So it, is the Department's view, and I'll ask Rachel on this later, is this only applicable going forward, that people who uh, are a victim of domestic abuse where the perpetrator is convicted under this new legislation, is that what this will apply to? And therefore, are there other aspects of domestic abuse, physical, that wouldn't be included in this? No, sorry, Chair, apologies if, if I wasn't clear on that. I think there's something of a concern that because the, the link in, for want of a better phrase, would simply be reference to there being domestic abuse, um, that, that you could basically, you know, you could potentially open the floodgates in, in terms of um, the way in which this is used. It, you know, there, there may be unintended consequences where for people that are faced with a significant legal bill, whether or not there may be benefit. Um, in terms of indicating that there is domestic abuse in that relationship in order to avail of um, the provisions of at hand. Okay, maybe Rachel, you can help me on this one. Um, just as my understanding, the way that it's been worded is where the client is a victim of domestic abuse in accordance with the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Act Northern Ireland 2020, so it would be going forward and only confined whenever the client applying for the legal aid waiver from the director is a victim under this bill. And, okay. So, so therefore it would not be open in floodgates to anybody that alleges domestic abuse because it would have to be proven. Okay. So essentially it would, in, in terms of, and I suppose that's maybe something to, that would be looked at at the, the, the drafting in due course, in, in terms of what you're proposing it would essentially be where there is um, an individual where there's a case being taken forward in relation to a domestic abuse offence or an aggravated offence. So, the, to put it honestly, I was surprised that this mess met scope. So, <laughs> surprised to see it on the Marshall list. But we do this. This has been deliberately put in with the domestic abuse and family proceedings. If the client who is in applying for eligibility for civil legal aid within the magistrates or the lower courts on contact orders to be exactly the same as the process it is with non malls if they have been found to be a victim, i.e. B, in the A and B relationship in the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, if, the, if they are B, then they can make that application, their solicitor can make that application, and they may earn a pound more than the, the financial eligibility, therefore not... Um, you know, not, not apply traditionally, but they can make an application under the exact same way that it works for non malls And it would add domestic, because it's in, within the Act, within the Children Northern Ireland Act, um, Order 1995, there is a list, a prescriptive list of offences that can be applied for financial el we, the waiving of financial el eligibility by the director. This adds the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Act to that list. Thank you. And did, for my clarity and apologies, Rachel, for putting you on the, on the spot here, but does that require, say the victim, the client, is, is person B, mm -hmm. does that require A to have been convicted? In my reading of this, yes. Yeah, that, that, because, from a, a layman, because that was my... Yes, and that to, to widen that out would require changes to the legal aid services regulations in a wider scope no, no, it's but fair, to, it's fair enough. to meet the requirements so if you have such as a friend of mine who's been dragged through the courts for the last 10 years by a convicted he has, yeah. was convicted um and a better drive of money on contact orders um 
So if you have, he, if say he had been convicted under this new act, she could apply for that waiver mm -hmm. because he has been convicted and she's proven to be B. Yeah. A has been convicted and B is proven to be the victim because we don't, we're not prescriptive about who's the victim in our bill. Mm -hmm. There is no de de description of who the victim is. It's all about the actions and the perpetrator and the meaning mm -hmm. personal connection because we don't have that. So yeah. it's to do with, it's protecting, trying to protect the B, future B. Yeah. No, and I think it's right that, listen, the, you've made clear what the intent is, and in all of this, there's further consideration stage to, if it needs to be more specific, to, to Chair, ensure that that intent is delivered. That's why that further consideration stage exists. And Chair, I would welcome the expertise of the yeah. departmental solicitors, and if there's something that I've missed here, or that needs to go in, I would absolutely welcome any detail or any additional um, you know, clauses or parts to that amendment that would do what I intended to do. Yeah. Um, so that because the wider people, can I, uh, yeah. in Sorry. relation to that, um, would you have an issue if the provision were to make reference to the fact that there had to be there had to have been a conviction in relation to the particular case? So the you know that that the case is concluded and that individual is it, it it's an individual that is a, a victim of. Um, you know, in, in that example that you were given, where where the offence has went through the courts and and has been dealt with. Absolutely. But it's my understanding that I couldn't have done that because of the requirements of it having to be within the context of this bill. Now, if I can, if that can be extended, where there doesn't need to be a conviction for B to get to apply for again for a discretionary um, application or a, a discretionary decision or apply for this absolutely because not everybody i.e b is going to be coming forward and get a conviction doesn't mean that abuse hasn't happened I, I think for what veronica is saying is that would you be opposed to an amendment at further consideration stage that puts that requirement in that it, to make it explicit that you are entitled on the basis of a conviction rather than oh Friend the other way out. <laughs> um, I would certainly welcome a... I would need more information on that. I mean, who does that apply to? Um, because the, the client and a victim, those two terms are quite broad already. But, um, I mean, again, I can, I can go through this in more detail and, and tend to on Tuesday. But um, if there, I would certainly welcome further clarification and information on what, what that would in, look like. And does that narrow the scope then even further? I think I, so I, I was thinking that in the, in, in the context of, um, you know, ensuring the types of cases that this would be utilised for, if, if there had been a decision in relation to a case, it would be clear, um, obviously, that there had been a conviction and someone in that particular instance was either guilty of the domestic abuse offence or was guilty of a, an, another aggravated offence. So, for example, criminal damage aggravated by domestic abuse. Okay. Um, Sinead Bradley. The broadcasting people can bring in Shidney and Bradley, please, from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. That line seems to work, Chair, each time. Um, yes, based on this, my reading of it was that it was a conviction, and maybe that was incorrect. But I think the the behavioural um, change that this amendment has, the, the I suppose, the power to maybe do is it shouldn't be overlooked. And I know Rachel and I did have this conversation. So, for example, if you have, uh, we, we talk about coercive behaviour and how they can weaponise almost everything around them. So to use the law as a weapon to further break the victim. So that definition of vic victim came to me um, as being established after a conviction was made. And therefore, you know, I don't know how the, how the projections um, that the department are referring to here could have been made, because all of that would be subject to how effective this bill is. Um, and for example, you know, how, how could we project the numbers? And that's dependent on all the things that we talk about, training, you know, making sure people recognize um, what domestic abuse is and are empowered to come forward. So I would, I would suggest any projections on how this might look would have to be taken um, very loosely at this stage because 
we can't possibly know how many people will engage in the in this new offence, come out the other side, and be victim of that repetitive behaviour where they try they try to break them by using the court system. And that said, I, I do wonder, and it was one of uh, the points I raised on it, you know, obviously we would hope that number, whilst of course we want the bill to be effective and we want engagement with it, you would still be hopeful that that number of people who are subjected to that would alter the mere fact that this legislation is here because the perpetrator will find that that's no longer a tool that can be weaponized. So it would have an effect without there having to be a huge financial implication, in my understanding. Okay, thank you. Shane, that's very helpful by way of clarification. And I suppose if, if I provide further clarification in terms of kind of the assumptions that we were making on, on the discussions that have been held, it was more in the context of effectively this applying where there had been abusive behaviour, which is obviously a very, very different quantum from um, numbers where there has been a conviction. So I suppose if, if the, the thrust of it were in relation to there having been a conviction, under um, the legislation, either by way of the domestic abuse offence or an aggravated offence, um, you know, that possibly is quite different. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any other questions members have for Veronica? Okay, Veronica. Sorry, Chair, can I, I think Paul had a query in relation to some of the provisions from the family site and again yeah. as I say it, it, it's not my area but I had emailed a, my colleague Jane McGuire who's been with me at committee before so Paul I think your provision or your um, query was in relation to the first of the amendments in relation to the um, family proceeding side of things A26 yes it so was Jane has... yes yes it was amendment 29 on the old Marshall list so Jane has come back to say that it amends the Children's Northern Ireland Order 1995 to require a court hearing and application for residence or contact to consider any conviction of the party applying for the order for you know to take into account the new domestic abuse offence where the child aggravator has been applied by reason of the offence involving the child. And she's also mentioned that um, really the provision is to correct an anomaly that would other, right, otherwise arise because a court considering the application for residence or contact is already required to consider harm caused to a child through seeing or hearing domestic violence. Um, so as, as I say, I, I think it's really to ensure that in those provisions going forward, or certainly that would be my understanding of it, that account is taken off the fact that um, you know the domestic abuse offence is, is coming into play and um, that it's looked at in, in the context of, of those provisions. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And again, I'll try and digest that as I speak here. Do, does it do something with the same intent that, that we're trying to achieve with regards to the court as a weapon? So, so does, it, does it, if you like, uh, allow the judge to have regard for a conviction of a person for the domestic violence abuse uh, whenever that person goes to court to, to acquire contact orders or residency? I'm not sure, Paul, to what extent it might um, deal with that issue in, in relation to that abusive process as such. As I say, what Jane has indicated to me, it's, it's basically requiring the court, when it's hearing those applications in relation to residence or contact orders, to consider any convictions that there are for um, the the new domestic abuse offence where the child aggravator has applied. So I suppose really the court should be taking that into account in terms of um, the decision that it arrives at. It, it's possibly not addressing it so much in the context of abusing the court process as such, but certainly what it would appear to do, and, and again, as I say, it, it's not my area, but what it would appear to do is to you know, ensure that the court takes that issue into account um, that there has been a conviction for the domestic abuse offence when it's having its deliberations in relation to that residence or contact order more generally. Yeah. So we suppose that would be an added factor in, in terms of um, arriving at its decision. Yeah, you see, and that's, to me that's important because one, it, the child's at the heart of this with regards to their safety. 
Uh, but not only that, it, it might indirectly stop or discourage or prevent someone going to court with nothing to lose um, and then running through the system if, if, if they knew then that the, the court could have regard for, previ- for the previous conviction, uh, which to my eyes is a very serious conviction, which is the one of the domestic abuse, involved, especially when it's the offence involving the child. So you can see there where the problem that the committee here and Rachel with her amendments trying to fix or trying to resolve or protect people, you could do this. This might be how you you could help that indirectly, which then could actually help reduce the bill and the consequence of Rachel's amendment if it was line, aligned up like that. If the stars align here, you could be doing something really, really useful, something really, really good. If it's any help as well, I'm sure Jane would be happy. I appreciate this obviously wouldn't be in a, in a committee context, but I'm sure Jane would be happy to have a, a chat with you to talk that provision through in, in more detail um, to ensure that I, you know, that, that what I've said is, is correct and, and also if you had any further queries in relation to it. Yeah, that, that would be quite helpful. And I, I have no doubt what you're saying is correct. It's whether I'm picking it up right is the, is the, is the problem here. But if, if, if what I've just assuaged to you, if that, if that actually... Is, is the design of that, or, or if something can be tweaked to, to have that impact and effect, then I think mm-hmm. that could be very, very useful. That could be very, very useful for the victims out there. But well, certainly, as I say, what Jane seems to be saying in her email is that basically when court is hearing those applications for those orders, it has to consider that there has been a conviction as, as part of that process. Yeah, and of course that would the, the heart of that is that. And you would imagine that should child. have a, a ben, you know that the result of that would be a beneficial impact potentially if, if, where there is a, a risk posed to that child. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Veronica. Can I thank you very much for taking the time of the committee again today? Much appreciated. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. Veronica. Okay, members. Um, so obviously, this was as a result of the minister's request. It was facilitated. The committee has carried out its work and reported and agreed its position on it. And um, there was a a window of opportunity um, that presented, um, as the minister put it this week, uh, due to the bill not being moved until now next week. So that's why we facilitated this. Um, so you. Officially, the committee doesn't need to change its already agreed position. Um, however, just so that I can um, make sure that we're we're still on the right page, uh, obviously, uh, it's whether the committee we can note the minister's proposed amendments to clause nine. Rachel has obviously proposed her amendment. Um, there had been a, an agreed committee position in respect of this prior to the department's intervention, which I touched on earlier with the minister. Um, and events then have moved on at that point, which has made it difficult for people to, to hold to that position because of the new information that has came to light. Um, and so it's at that point, uh, as to what members wish to do, um, we can note the Minister's position uh, around Clause 9, um, and ultimately it becomes a party political issue on Tuesday, rather than having an agreed committee position if there isn't going to be one. So, uh, listen, I'm happy to make a proposal just to get it that we note the Minister's position that this will be left now to the parties to decide how they're going to vote on this issue when it comes to next Tuesday as opposed to the committee taking a position around Clause 9. Members content with that recommendation? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the area that we um, dealt with um, around the 18- to 16-year-old issue, that was something the committee considered. We discussed it at length. We um, had indicated, um, you know, in terms of the committee stage, that we had noted it. We expected the department to ensure that the gap created for 16 and 17 year olds, um, assuming that the amendment to child cruelty offence was made, that would it would be fully addressed, and then we would consider any further information. So, uh, I know from my perspective as a party, the 18 to 16 is something that we're going to support. Mm-hmm. The, the committee had indicated that that was the travel of direction, but we couldn't take a formal view because we didn't have the amendment. So I suppose it's whether the committee wants to to now indicate um, on Tuesday that 
this amendment is in line with where the committee had been and that the committee was therefore minded to support it, or again whether people just want to leave it as the committee report has now dealt with it, Linda? I understand Sinead's, you know, Sinead's concerns around this and, and she raised them with, directly with the Minister. But I would be proposing that we as a committee would take a position on this if possible. Um, just because we have lots of other things that are going to be very complex and complicated and if we can simplify any part of it, I would, I would appreciate it. But that's a personal view, so that, that is my proposal. That if, if possible, we would take a committee position on it. On what amendment? Sorry, I missed it. These are, these are the amendments to Clause 11 and 17, 17. Oh, the age, to which relates to the 18- to 16-year-old issue, um, which I'm, I'm happy to... I'm happy to. You know, at the minute, the committee's official position is, as I outlined, that we had looked at it, we wanted this addressed, but we couldn't take a formal view because we didn't have the amendment. It's whether or not we just want to take that next step to say, now that we have it, um, we're in a position as a committee to indicate that we're supportive of those amendments. Sinead Bradley. You're mute. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I think it would be, um, for the, the reasons Linda pointed out, it would, if we could get to a committee view on this now, all the better. Um, I did want to raise that point because this is suboptimal land and place, and there's a body of work to do beyond this. But that said, um, I would be supportive of it, and I know the party will be supportive of it, but I do think that it needed to be on the record that there is a, a piece of work to happen beyond this to align things better across the statutes. Okay, Rachel and Doug. Yep, um, thanks Chair, just like Sinead, I'm, I'm content to support um, a, committee, a committee position on it and it would be in favour of it. But like Sinead, this does signal more work and this would need to be the beginning of the work to, to harmonise because to create an arbitrary distinction between a 15 year old and a 16 year old when it comes to abuse, um, should not be happening. So certainly, uh, work for this department in conjunction with the Department of Health. Doug. Okay. Yeah, Chair, we're we're um, content and supportive of Amendment Eleven. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, we'll we'll reflect that as a committee position on on Tuesday in terms of the amendments that relate to clauses eleven and seventeen that have been tabled by the minister. Um, I'll send a note officially. You know, I'll ask Christine to send a note to members, just indicating these are the specific amendments that that relates to that the committee position will now reflect, and I'll reflect that as chairman on behalf of the committee. So, in terms of the other um, committee amendments, um, we had agreed that we would be moving them, um, and I'm not proposing that we we change that approach. Obviously, there's been discussion with the minister around aspects of this related to uh, training and so on, which um, I think there is opportunity at further consideration stage. I've indicated you know, I have some sympathy that the duty should be placed directly upon um, organisations rather than the department, which we could deal with at uh, further consideration stage. However, the, the annual and mandatory requirement of training that the minister is opposed to, I don't think that's something that we can bridge. Um, and that requires our amendment to be moved in order to ensure that that happens. Yeah. Um, so, if members are content, the, the other committee amendments um, will continue to proceed as they have been tabled. Uh, and the minister has indicated she's not going to, to move some of hers in order to work with us at further consideration stage. Um, sure. Sinead, yes. Sorry, Chair, just to comment on that one. Um, you know, I really do appreciate the Minister doing that because as Stephanie um highlighted to us as a committee that if you introduce a notion, you know, or an idea or a concept that's agreed at this stage, it can't be overwritten. Um and in that same vein, you know, I I, I just wanted to have it on record that on amendment um twenty three, you know, that we basically are right in terms of you know that it shouldn't be you know we need to stick with that whole annual concept but um when the minister pointed out to us that the duty didn't lie with the department um and it was with other agencies i'm just really mindful and cautious of if we then move on that one particular um amendment and hold a position that can't be overwritten can it 
even on reflection, even if we all agree then, yes, you know, we all have sympathy for the department and it doesn't rest with the department. I don't know how we can reverse out of that. Well, it's my understanding that, that we can, because the aim here is having a legal duty to ensure that there's training, um, making sure the appropriate body uh, can be then changed at further consideration stage, so that appropriate body wouldn't, if we were minded to, wouldn't be the department um, in terms of certainly the public prosecution service and the police service. It may well still remain the duty on the department for the court service, because that sits you know, within the, the department. But um, that we can still work with that to tidy that up at further consideration stage. That's certainly the advice that I've been given. Yeah. I'm satisfied with that. It's just to have that advice because it was just that first opening for four or five words that said it is on the you know, the responsibility of the department. As long as we have scope to maybe reverse on that, I'm satisfied with that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So listen, our committee amendments will remain as agreed, and I'll move them accordingly. Um, and the Minister isn't going to move someone reporting Operation Encompass, for example, and I, I welcome her decision on that, and that she'll then assist in, in making sure that that's as effective as, as what we wish to do. So if members are content, we're going to move on. Right, Chair, can I just add, just I know that um, there, there's a number of amendments with my name attached to them yes. that have come into conversation, <clears throat> but particularly the legal, the legal aid one. And just in terms of clarity, and I think I got myself confused during that question in there. Um, but in terms of who, what, what constitutes a victim, it's quite open. And I think that there is the waiver can apply in other ways to like to address it to you know someone who's not just been convicted or been proven to be. But there are other ways in the conviction scenario that might be better for victims that haven't been convicted, such as looking through Marac. Um, and risk assessments or support organisations letters. Um, so I, there's still a bit of openness there um, from that, and I will make my case. I'm happy to make my case to anybody from now until Tuesday, but I'll make my case again on Tuesday on this. So apologies if I have said it would, you know, the scope mm -hmm. is only on those convicted, but there could, there should be other avenues open. And I'm specifically looking at this in terms of the bill that we have in front of us and Section 11 of Clause 26 which is the prohibition of cross-examination in family proceedings, and the department can have a duty to bring forward regulations that specify what evidence of domestic abuse will constitute for the purposes of the court in a similar way. So it's not just those who have been convicted, try to, you know, try to court and convicted as being perpetrators and therefore they're being a victim, um, but those that maybe are through the courts or that there is another type of evidence such as that put through MARAC or support or organisation letters to say that they are a victim. So apologies if I have completely okay. messed up and said only those that have been convicted, but that is the that's the idea behind this. Yeah. Um, and I am more than happy to have any conversations with anybody before Tuesday on this. No, that that's fine. Um, I suppose the reason I hadn't, I was going to pick it up, but in terms of the committee's positions, we've dealt with that, and then on that amendment fourteen, obviously there there hasn't been a committee view on that and I'm just trying to tease out myself what does that mean and and you know I have sympathy for it and I'm just trying to figure out though how will it be implemented what's the parameters criteria and you know if this relates to which understandably it has to to be within scope for this bill however people that are subject of domestic abuse through physical violence um, and you know, other aspects of domestic abuse that, that may not be captured in this bill. I think that people will be saying this should be applied to them as well. And then there's also the retrospective nature potentially of this, because this is an ongoing thing for a lot of victims um, of domestic abuse in all of its different forms. And I think people will be sympathetic to saying it needs to apply to that as well. So there's a chain of events that I think would flow from this amendment being passed. Um, and so beyond me being sympathetic to this, I need to know more what I'm doing, um, the potential ramifications. Um, but that's where I see further consideration stage as maybe setting parameters on this, some that you maybe wouldn't agree with, but ensures that um, I'm doing things in a, in a way that I can put my hand up to. Linda? Just in a similar vein to Paul, I think further consideration stage is an opportunity for the 
the department to bring forward you know amendments that might set parameters and, and we'll look at those and scrutinize them and, and decide you know really where where we sit in relation to those without saying them we we can't have any notion whether we'll, we'll support or, or won't support them but just a quickly point on what you just said around the those who suffer domestic abuse am i not correct in saying that that already is dealt with in relation to eligibility for when it comes to physical for example uh-huh. um there are a couple of, of areas that are already there's already that discretionary and, is and is, is trafficking is one of them um and is domestic violence not the other i don't believe so but do not quote me yeah. on this I will well can find i out can i you. ask yeah i was yeah. gonna say can i ask if you were could could, could you check that yeah. out for us and if that, that's information that would be helpful in a big file time. upstairs in room 259 no <laughs> um no and again i'm i'm more than happy to speak to any individual member no, i appreciate exactly. this is not a committee um, amendment and it has mm-hmm. been brought up today but just to make it very clear that it is not confined to those who are convicted that is was a mistake on my part so it's okay thanks happily. and i will get you that information sinead wants to come in on this point too rachel so you're doing well sorry yeah no thank you chair that's fine it's been answered thank you okay <laughs> okay great Okay, well, I think there'll be more discussion on Amendment 14. It's, it, it's down there for me as un, uncompleted in terms of our position on it, so we just need to keep working on that one, but I'm happy to do that outside of the, the committee process. Okay, in terms of further consideration stage, um, it's likely that that's going to be scheduled um, on the 7th of December, so that gives a very short window because we've lost a week from consideration stage then that means further consideration stage is is going to be very compressed to allow the committee to consider things so in terms of just handling that um the department obviously is going to have to liaise with the committee on further amendments which will either be laid by the department or this committee or there could be both i'm um, going through um and there's only going to be two committee meetings that are currently scheduled um, during that that window, which is the 19th of November and the 26th of November, um, and the deadline for tabling those amendments will be on Wednesday, the 2nd of December. Um, so, if members are content, um, I'm going to propose that the consideration of amendments that we schedule at for the committee meeting on Thursday, the 26th of November, um, and we'll be asking then for the text of any amendments from the department um, to be brought and delivered to the committee by Monday the 23rd to allow the committee to have access to that before our meeting on the 26th so that we have that in our pack and get, can get advice on it for members to properly consider this on the 26th of November. And we'll schedule officials uh, to attend the meeting on the 26th of November to answer any questions. And provisionally, if I can just pencil it in for members, we will provisionally try, um, if we can avoid it, we'll avoid it, but a meeting on Tuesday, the 1st of December at one o'clock as a fail safe that if we can't get things finalized on the 26th of November, then Tuesday the 1st is the last possible meeting that we can have given that amendments need to be tabled at half nine the next day. So if members are agreed with that, then we'll, we'll proceed on that basis. Okay. Agenda item five, development and implementation of a statutory registration scheme for legal aid practitioners. The department has provided an update on the development of a statutory registration scheme for legal aid practitioners. The department has advised that the primary purpose of a registration scheme is to provide a system to assess the quality and value for money of legal aid services and improve transparency and accountability for services funded from the public purse. Two consultations have now been carried out. The first in 2014 was focused on the overall policy and initial proposals on the audit framework, codes of practice, education and the registration fee, while the second um, consultation was in 2017. That focused on enabling draft legislation and codes of practice for the scheme. The Department has outlined that respondents to the uh, to the 2017 consultation raised concerns on the apparent change of emphasis of the scheme from quality to a stronger focus on compliance, the speed and approach of implementation, 
potential overlaps with the regulatory responsibilities of the professional bodies and value for money of the scheme. So the Department now proceed, uh, proposes to proceed with the scheme slightly differently to what had previously been envisaged by scaling back audit ambitions and having more focus on quality. The Department has advised that it will be a minimum viable model that will be developed over time. In addition, uh, work is being carried out on an outcome statement to clarify what legal aid uh, is for and how it should be delivered and on the re remuneration reform. So, if members are content that we would request some further information, which is outlined in the clerk's memo of your meeting pack at page 24, um, and we'll seek that information. And if there's any other information members wish to have, we can request that. Linda? Just what are the differences between what was proposed in 2017 and now? Okay, we can add that. The rest is in the clerk's memo. Okay, and then members will will keep it open that there's the potential for an oral of uh, an oral evidence session. Then, once we get the further information, um, that's a potential that we can have with officials, given there's been considerable delays in progressing this issue, um, 2014, 2017. Um, so it's obviously an area of concern. Um, before getting into the detail of proposed statutory rules, but we'll, we'll keep that open without taking a definitive position on that subject to the information that we get back. Okay. Then the next item is the Sajini report on the review of policing and community safety partnerships. The Department has provided a, a written paper uh, updating the committee on the recommendations within the Sajini report, um, which was working together for safer communities, and that was published in August 2019. <coughs> the 2019 report acknowledged the progress made since the previous 2014 uh, report, including a greater sense of cohesion within and across uh, the partnerships. The report made five strategic recommendations and two operational ones, and an outcomes-based action plan has been developed in response to uh, the report. Dear members, if you are content, we will ask the Department to clarify why the terms of reference for the Task and Finish Group for Strategic Recommendation 1 includes an objective to consider the rationale for subsuming the Belfast Principal Partnership into the four district partnerships, given that the recommendation has already been accepted by the Joint Committee, which is oversight for uh, these partnerships. So we will ask that information just so that we can get that, and if any other members. Rachel Woods. Right, Linda had her hand up first. Right. Okay. Just, just a couple of um, questions. If we can find out what efforts DOJ made to try and ensure that the PCSPs and their statutory partners were involved in both the decision making in advance of embarking on the various pieces of work and in carrying out the pieces of work, can we ask why the task and finish group have not met since March? 2020, and I'm assuming it may well be to do with COVID, but we're all managing to meet this way, so just wondering why that's the case. Um, and the last one just is that the implementation of the Strategic Recommendation 1 will require amendment to the Justice Act 2011. Can we get a time frame from the Department on when the legislative changes are likely to be brought forward? Okay. And how? Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, I have a number of questions um, on that. First of all, the, um, I just want to like to clarify what efforts the Department has had in to replace representatives from statutory organisations on PCSPs. Uh, for example, in Arts and North Down, there hasn't been a Health Trust representative on for 20 months. And what efforts the Department have made to replace that rep um, in conjunction with the Trusts. Um, in terms of the next Jenny report then as well, is it another five years um, or will it, will it be continuous? And a third question is on the membership of PCSPs, the political membership. We had an issue um, when I've, I was chair of PCSP in Arts and North Down regarding the makeup, political makeup of PCSP and it had gone back to the previous Justice Minister, David Ford, making a call on the application of the Dehaunt allocation, which meant that the small parties, not including our own, but the small parties and independent grouping, did not have a seat at the PCSP, and therefore I would argue that did not make up um, a reflection of, 
our communities in Ards and North Down, um, and meant that a decision had to be taken uh, by council, which the previous Justice Minister found to be contrary to the Justice Act 2011, and we had to then change it at the previous AGM after the last local election. So I would like to clarify whether or not it is this current Minister's um, position uh, would be the same as the previous Justice Minister um, for Alliance, David Ford, if the 2015 um, sort of decision still stands. Okay. Anyone else any questions to raise? Okay, well then we'll, we'll raise those issues with the Department. Okay, correspondence. Nine items of correspondence. Um, let me draw attention to one of them. There's correspondence from the Minister advising that she has asked the uh, Chief Inspector of the Criminal Justice Inspection uh, for Northern Ireland to undertake a focused review of the operation of care and supervision units in the prison service and to report her findings uh, as soon as possible. Um, and if members are happy to note the letters, unless there's any other clarification required. Okay, sorry, Rachel. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, the, just with regard to the review of CSUs, um, something I have been looking at. Um, how, could I could we maybe clarify what role the independent monitoring board will have within this review, if possible? Just note that they're not mentioned in the minister's letter. Sure. Can we ask also? It's probably not available yet, but when it is available, that we get a copy of the terms of reference of the review. If possible. Okay. Thank you. And content will action the items then as outlined in the clerk's memo. Chairman's business. Um, one brief item. Um, chair, chair, the chair's liaison group, the EU affairs manager, is providing a briefing session for all committee chairs and vice chairs to explain how common frameworks are developed and how assembly committee scrutiny of these will operate. Uh, in terms of justice, though, the current information from the EU Affairs Manager indicates that there are no common frameworks, either legislative or non-legislative, that fall to DOJ and therefore to this committee for scrutiny. Uh, instead, the UK Government's analysis includes justice-related matters as no further action areas, uh, which are policy areas where no action is required to create a framework, and the government and devolved administrations uh, will continue to operate. So if members are content, I'm going to to write to the department to confirm if that is the case, just to be absolutely sure. Is there any other business? Okay. Then the next meeting is Thursday the 19th at 2 p.m. and it will be held in room 30. And we'll see you for the debate on Tuesday. Meeting adjourned. Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme.